Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019 meeting of the Weather Seal Planning and Zoning Commission. Would the clerk help me with the roll call? Uh, Chairman Harley. Here. Vice Chairman Roberts. Here. I'm here. Mr. Hughes. Mr. Oichel. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. Mr. Silver. Here. Mr. Edwards. Ms. Antonia. Yes. Ms. Murphy. Here. All right. So thank you. If my math is correct, there are 10 of us, and one of the alternates um, will not participate in the vote. It's, All my, right. it's my turn to sit out. All right. Thanks, Lisa. But she can uh, participate in the hearing, in the hearing not right? the deliberation. Right. Thank you. So uh, I'll make a motion we take item 3.1 out of order. Move right along. I have a second for that? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Peter, could you help us? Sure. I think um, Mr. DeBacco uh, was planning on being here, but he may be uh, delayed. Maybe he'll uh, join us while uh, we're still on this agenda item. This should, shouldn't take very long. Uh, so we have a uh, request to reduce the original bond. Uh, that we are holding for the Reservoir Estate Subdivision, which was application number 1884-15-Z, which was CCC construction. Um, you have a uh, memorandum and um, a, an estimate, reduced bond estimate from the town engineer. The town engineer, Derek Greger, uh, does recommend uh, the uh, reduced bond amount based on the spreadsheet that he's prepared for you. Um, there is uh, some work uh, remaining. I think the number is in the neighborhood of 99, uh, Nine. 913. Yeah, something in, in that neighborhood. Um, so the town engineer does recommend uh, the uh, reduced bond amount. There is work still to be done. And uh, as the uh, homes get built uh, in this subdivision, uh, the remaining work uh, will be done. This only applies to phase one of that subdivision, which I think had three uh, separate individual phases. So it's a relatively straightforward um, matter and uh, as stated the town engineer uh, does recommend the reduced bond amount does the developer dispute any of this no he was provided copies uh, of the bond estimate uh, i believe the town engineer did work with his engineer and came up with the uh, numbers i did not hear any uh, uh, contrary position taken by the uh, developer as I said, he was um, informed of this agenda item and was planning on being here. So, um, I did, but I did not hear any opposition to the numbers uh, quoted by the town engineer. Right. Make a motion we reduce the bond amount to ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and thirteen. Second. Um, George. Uh, any, any issue with that? Karma piece of land and it's breaking, paving the road. And we actually. Um, we actually received the um, uh, revised mylars yesterday. Um, the town engineer has just, as of as of the end of business today, uh, gone out on uh, 
medical leave. He's having some surgery. So we'll take that up again uh, in a couple of weeks. He hasn't. He didn't have the chance to review the revised mylars before tonight's meeting, but that has now come to the point where we have all those in place now. They would appear to, but I remember. Yes. Yep. Okay, so revised to move the sidewalk to the side where it wasn't supposed to be? Um, revised to the, uh, if you also remember, we changed the right of way line around. We also uh, uh, split and then unsplit the lot. So it, it deals with all of those uh, related <laughs> issues. So it wasn't just um, the sidewalk issue, but yes, it does uh, resolve um, those issues to, to, uh, to the satisfaction of, of all parties. All parties. Yes. Right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. We're moving back to item 2.1. 2.1, application number 2027-19-Z, Wag Time Play and Stay LLC. Seeking a special permit in accordance with 53A14 and 53B6 of the Westfield Zoning Regulations to convert a portion of a parking lot to an outdoor kennel area at 60 Beaver Road. <coughs> so as a reminder, we've heard this before, and I just want to uh, clarify for the record, Tony, you did not sit on the last meeting, and uh, Yolanda, you either. Have you familiarized yourself with the record and feel I confident? Mm -hmm. I've reviewed everything that Mr. Chairman is willing to participate. Right. Thank you. All right. So, um, so I want to try and highlight, you know, if we can, just generally. Um, what the new information is that we have before us tonight, as well as affirm that people have, uh, keep in mind the, the stuff that we had last time. So I do see that we have a, um, a wetland approval, which is new this time around. That's correct, yes. All right. And um, we have a petition with some 30 names on it that are opposed to the application. Their, their reason for it is primarily focused on uh, the nuisance regulations of the town. Right? There is a uh, large package of uh, uh, proponents of the proposal as well. Uh, I didn't see any new ones since the last hearing. They were all dated prior to the 14th, so it's the same package, correct? Yes. All right. Um, we have the acoustical report. Are there any, so, so beyond that, is there anything else that, that's new to the record? I didn't see any staff reports that are new or anything like that. No, no staff reports. You do have the uh, revised uh, site plan uh, in front of you that uh, came in this afternoon, which um, spells out the uh, final details of the basin and the extent of the fence. And then you also, at the last meeting, asked for uh, some um, topographic uh, elevations to illustrate uh, the elevations of the uh, subject property on Beaver Road, and then um, the nearest residence on Lincoln. Uh, so you have that information uh, also. I think it's based on the town's GIS system and the uh, topographic information found uh, 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 with that source. Um, so that was provided also today, uh, and I left a copy of that with, uh, with all of you. Um, I, th I don't think there is any other new information. There were several things received at the last meeting, um, which uh, you were all given uh, copies of. As I look, the only, no, that was in October. So I think um, there was nothing fresh, nothing new. The, the, there was an addendum to the sound uh, report, the, the acoustical report. If you look at the uh, last page or last two pages of that report. There was a supplement to that report. Um, I think uh, that should cover uh, the updated. And, and as you did mention, there was the approval letter from the uh, Inland Wetlands and Conservation Commission, which was dated November 21st. So I think that summarizes it. All right, thank you, Peter. Which brings us to the applicant. Would the applicant join us at the microphone? And introduce yourself again, and then uh, I think there's some changes on the plan, so I'm sure you're going to go through that, right? 
Yes, indeed. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Robin Pearson. I'm an attorney with the firm of Alter and Pearson in Glastonbury, Connecticut, and I am pleased to be here this evening on behalf of Jeffrey and Brian Cousins. They are both brothers, and between them and in various uh, entities, they are both the owner of the property at 60 Beaver Road and the owner of the business that's own as, known as Wag Time Play and Stay. Um, it's a dog um, uh, daycare uh, facility. It is a use that's established as a commercial kennel within the existing general business zone. Uh, it's been authorized by the state, received its requisite permits. Um, that use in and of itself has been approved and authorized by the town as being in compliance with zoning. <clears throat> The uh, issue that brings us here this evening is the continuation of a hearing at which um, the application was considered both for an accessory use, which is the dog play area behind the building at 60 Beaver Road, as well as an accessory structure uh, which is proposed. And at the time of our prior hearing, we had proposed uh, a sound attenuation wall that would basically buffer the sound to the neighborhood to the east, residential neighborhood to the east, um, which is residentially zoned, of course, on the other side of the railroad tracks uh, as it abuts this commercially zoned property. Uh, last month, I believe it's fair to say, our hearing was continued for several reasons. One was to allow more commissioners to become acquainted with the application materials and the testimony that was presented at the public hearing by both the applicant and uh, the public. Uh, also to allow the applicant to respond to various questions, some of which were um, put forth by the commission uh, regarding the possibility for additional sound attenuation um, proposals with regard to the outside play area and also to allow the applicant to present a plan for the management and treatment of stormwater runoff from the play area within the 100-year floodplain, uh, which required going to the Inland Wetland Commission, which regulates within the 100-year floodplain, uh, for its consideration and approval of uh, what we proposed, which was an infiltration swale at the end of the, the easterly end of the dog play area, the outside area, mm -hmm. for the treatment of um, water runoff. And to that end, based on all those reasons the hearing was continued, we have submitted an updated sound attenuation analysis report by SH Acoustics with an addendum which is dated November 27th in which SH Acoustics analyzes the positive impact on neighboring properties with additional sound fencing so that all three exposed areas of the fenced, currently fenced with chain link, but of the fenced in play area will receive the sound attenuation wall treatment. Um, and we had been specifically asked to look at whether or not there was something that could be done on the southerly border um, which is within, uh, it would be uh, adjacent to another commercially zoned property, um, and we took the liberty of going further and enclosing all three exposed sides now. Uh, we also secured approval from the Inland Wetland and Conservation Commission on November 20 for the design of the infiltration swale at the easterly end of the outdoor um, play area. You should have that uh, approval as part of your record. Um, should this application be approved, uh, our engineering consultant says the way it would work is the infiltration swale would be built first and then the fencing would be put in once that work has been completed because that requires getting a backhoe in there and doing some digging to actually construct it. All of which is, that I was told was basically a day's job. It's not significant, but it is effective and, and will certainly serve the purpose for which it is designed and then the fence can be installed once that's complete. <coughs> um, we've also provided you, and we'll go through it in more detail, information on area grading in relationship to the play area. Mm -hmm. You had asked whether the grading had any possible significance with regard to our sound consultant's analysis, 
as to the effectiveness of the sound attenuation fence that we had proposed, and I will let um, Kevin Peterson go through that for you. And finally, we have submitted an updated plan, which was um, included all the information that was presented to the Inland Wetland Agency for work within the floodplain, and also has the updated information on the sound enclosure that goes around all three exposed sides of the play area. Uh, with regard to what we'd like to go through this evening, um, Jeffrey and Brian Cousins are here to answer any specific questions. Kevin Peterson will do um, the presentation on the sound analysis and the addendum and the, the new provisions that we have provided. I just want to remind the commission that we did previously describe for you the process that got us to this point where we are before you asking for approval of a special permit for the accessory use and the accessory sound attenuation wall structure. <clears throat> and I just want to remind you, because it is important, that the cousins did not go into this um, business without doing due diligence and, and working with the town and trying to understand exactly what would be needed before they invested. I think I mentioned it was over half a million dollars just to acquire the property and a significant investment after that in upgrading the facility, which had been a veterinary facility for 100 dogs. Uh, but they, they did go to the town. They did not hire a land use attorney, so if they had, perhaps none of this would be happening the way it's rolling out. But nonetheless, um, they did mention that they described ultimately that for their dog care business, they would need a fenced in outdoor area. They did not know, nor were they told that they would need a fence that showed that. At one point, I understand they asked uh, the zoning enforcement officer whether they needed a fence permit and was told they did not. But I just want to underscore that they never tried to hide the fact that that was an integral part of their business operation and their business, and I think uh, Jeffrey Cousins underscored that when he was asked at the last meeting, the business does not work without an outdoor play area. That is something that people expect to find in a good doggy daycare place. In fact, they told me today they had uh, three people call and specifically asked whether the dogs would be able to go outside and play in the snow. They were, uh, I don't know, Malmuts or, or Yukon-type dogs who like being out in the snow in particular. So it's, it is very important to dog owners that they be able to have a place where the dogs can run around outside, toss and tussle and, you know, tire themselves out playing as, as kids would in a playground all day long. And that, that is key to be able to have this business um, be one that can succeed at this location. So they did proceed. Um, they opened the business. They installed the fence to keep the dogs in the outdoor play area, which was uh, basically reusing what had been a paved parking lot for the veterinary facility. Um, back in July 20 of 2018, they actually installed that fence. So that area has been used openly without you know, any intent to deceive anybody or do anything wrong since uh, for over a year and what, three or four months. So it's been a long time that that area has been actively used um, for the dog play area. So I just wanna reiterate that, especially for those of you who uh, were not here at the last meeting. I know you've had a chance to go through the record, but that's important and I wanted to underscore it for you. So I'm gonna have Kevin come on up now, Kevin Peterson, and go through his uh, additional analysis and the new information we've presented to you. And um, before he gets started, I'd like to reiterate what we said at the beginning of our presentation last time, and that is that If you approve this special permit application for both the use and the structure, we can resolve the noise issues that the neighbors have experienced. We acknowledge that they have experienced a difficult situation because even our sound report notes that when those dogs are aggravated, um, they do exceed the acceptable noise levels for the area. But we can fix it. 
and that's what's important. It can, this issue can be resolved, and that's the purpose of having us come before you for a special use permit. It's the purpose of having a public hearing. It's the purpose of hiring a sound consultant to come up with a reasonable way of managing this so that everybody, a business use and a business zone, can reside comfortably and compatibili compatibly with a residential use on the other side of the railroad track in a residential zone. So um, one other thing, um, Mr. Gillespie asked that um, whether or not we had or were going to be able to uh, reference any particular dog sound attenuation projects that our consultant had worked on already that we could mention to you as a, an example of something that works. And I, at the last hearing, he did say that he had never actually done one of those, but I asked him if he could, well, are there other things that you could discuss or mention for the commission that have to do with sound attenuation in anything that's in any way compatible, um, be, be basically to underscore the fact that this works and that they have experience with it. So he is going to go through that a little bit for you also. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Sure, yes. Okay, thank you. Just give me a second to set up. We have more exhibits for you. Um, these are Kevin's uh, business cards. We submitted some of these at the last hearing, but it's a brochure about SH Acoustics. And I think um, there can be no doubt when you look it over and think about their capabilities, you can understand that they are eminently qualified to be able to do this kind of analysis. And uh, they know what they're doing. And when they say something can work, um, they are professional, they are experts in this area. And you can have confidence that what it is they say can be achieved with proper sound attenuation construction, wall construction, will indeed be something that will be experienced by, uh, by our client and also by the neighbors in terms of the reduction in the noise emanating from um, the barking dogs at play in the back of this particular business. Yes, okay. Thank you. So as she mentioned, uh, my name is Kevin Peterson. Um, I know I spoke with uh, most of you last time, but um, to uh, um, just sort of uh, go over who, uh, who we are, my company, um, SH Acoustics. Uh, we're a, an acoustic consulting firm based out of Milford, Connecticut. Um, we work on all sorts of noise control uh, projects from outdoor environmental noise uh, issues similar to this one to um, high-end home theaters, concert venues, uh, museums. Um, so there's a there's a few uh, recent projects that we've that we've worked on as a company. Um, I and and there's some uh, some more pictures. You can see more pictures in the uh, in the brochure as well, um, and learn a little bit more about uh, the the kind of work we do, uh, the kind the level of work we do as well. A um, um, little bit of background. I was uh, um, valedictorian of my class. Um, I uh, worked as a um, uh, acoustician um, for, a, for a different firm and served as chief consulting officer eventually um, before coming over to SH Acoustics. Um, here's some of the companies that I've worked uh, with that I've consulted for, um, design studios for, design uh, noise control solutions. Um, uh, Robin had mentioned that um, I have done, although I haven't done work specifically controlling dog noise, um, I have done work uh, you know, uh, with a with a similar um, approach of using a sound attenuation wall to control various types of noise. Um, probably the most relevant one is, uh, if you can see um, up near my picture, there's a radio station called KEXP. That's a, uh, a studio that um, uh, I was part of the design for um, out in Seattle. And directly next door to that radio station uh, is the Key Arena, which is going to be the home of the new Seattle um, hockey team. Uh, that needed to go 
under extensive renovations, uh, which meant a lot of construction equipment, noise blasting, um, and directly next to that, we had a recording studio that, that we were very concerned about. Um, in addition to that, there was residential properties across the street um, from the um, uh, what was going to be the construction zone. Um, we uh, attacked that issue uh, with um, a sound attenuation wall, just like the one that, that we are uh, proposing um, at uh, WAG time play and stay. Uh, that would have been a temporary wall, or it is a temporary wall. Um, and uh, actually another another uh, project on there, as you'll see QVC, um, they had an outdoor uh, set where, you know, if you, if you watch QVC, um, uh, you'll see sometimes they go to an outdoor uh, video shoot. And um, they had a bunch of air conditioning um, uh, units outside, condensers, uh, that were really... Uh, covering up the, the noise, you know, really getting into the broadcast, um, and they needed to fix that somehow, and, uh, and uh, my firm was able to um, reduce the amount of noise coming from those units um, and, uh, and quiet the set. Uh, that way they could uh, pick up more of what they were actually uh, looking for. Um, uh, so that's just a... Uh, an overall shot of the area. I think people are, are familiar with that. Um, as explained last time, um, the uh, town of Weathersfield um, noise ordinance um, is for a general business um, zoned area to a residential area during daytime hours um, uh, has a allowable level of 55 decibels. Um, so that is um, the uh, you know, the, the code that we're aiming for, um, although we uh, approached it with a, with a, a little bit of um, uh, more of a conservative approach and wanted to get sort of the worst case scenario um, from the dogs. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll get into that a little bit about um, how we tested um, later on. Um, but that's, that's uh, essentially what we are, what we're aiming for. Um, this is more uh, text from the uh, noise ordinance. Um, so the measurement process that we went through, um, we took three measurements or, or three different, uh, measured three different conditions. Um, I set up a microphone, uh, you know, where you can see that uh, in the pictures um, on the other side of the railroad tracks near the uh, property line of 33 Lincoln and, uh, and pressed record and, and let it measure for a couple hours. Um, during those, during that time, uh, we measured the background noise, uh, which you can see in the picture all the way to the left, um, where there was absolutely no dogs outside, um, so you couldn't, uh, no dogs barking, um, and we just measured the background level to um, uh, more to understand what the ambient noise levels uh, were. The next is we let the dogs back out, um, and uh, we just let them roam around for a little while. Uh, actually a long while, um, and just recorded what their normal play um, levels were. And then we um, measured the excited dogs, uh, which, and by that, I just went outside of the, um, the fence area, um, all the dogs seeing something, a, a person outside of the area that, um, that they don't normally see. They got excited. They started barking a lot, um, quite loudly, and we took the loudest second of that entire measurement um, which, oh, well, actually, here's, here's another um, overall view uh, and, and the times that I took those. But uh, next slide will show um, the loudest second of that excited dogs moment when, when I was outside of the, directly outside of the fence um, and they were all uh, running over to me and barking. Um, the loudest second of that, of that measurement was 71.9 decibels. So we took that and we said, uh, how can we reduce 71.9 decibels um, down to within the noise code? Um, and how tall of a wall and what does it need to be made out of um, in order for that to happen? I should also mention that um, during the measurement uh, for the uh, typical dogs, which, uh, which meant they were unprovoked but just still running around and, and playing with each other, um, the loudest point throughout that measurement was 66.7 decibels coming from the dogs. There was another point during that measurement where we reached uh, 68 and a half decibels from um, just wind noise. 
um, and and uh, and ambient noise is mostly a, a gust of wind that I think that caused that one. But um, 66.7 from the dogs uh, under typical conditions, and 71.9 uh, with uh, with provoked dogs. We're considering that to be the the worst case scenario. Um, so my original report, I had recommended an eight foot wall uh, made out of uh, three quarter inch plywood or one inch cedar planks, um, and you can see the. Uh, the uh, decibel reductions brings that 72 decibels. It's, um, that's the worst case scenario, um, down to 55 decibels, um, which, is, uh, which is on the noise, noise code. And um, the 67 decibels during the, the normal uh, kind of typical conditions down to 50 decibels. Um, after speaking with my client, um, they had asked me, sort of one of the first questions they asked me was, can, can we do even better than this? Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, I looked back at the study and um, we saw what would happen if we made the wall thicker. So we're using two by 12 lumber. Um, it's obviously thicker than, uh, than the three quarter ply or one inch um, uh, cedar planks. Um, and uh, we made it a, a 10 foot wall. Um, this reduces noise um, by 20 decibels, so it'll bring that 72 worst case scenario down to 52 decibels. So um, under the, you know, the, the most excited they were throughout that measurement, um, it would be brought down to 52 decibels of the property line of 33 Lincoln and uh, reduced a typical 67 decibels um, down to, uh, to 47. Um, in addition to that, after um, the last hearing, we uh, uh, decided to extend the walls so that um, it's not just uh, taking care of those uh, residential properties uh, to the northeast, but including the, the southern property line um, so that we would be protected or we'd be protecting the, uh, the property directly to um, the south. And uh, you'll see in my um, addendum uh, report that, that um, the noise code can be can be met as well. Um, it's a it's a general business um, zoned area uh, directly south, uh, which means the noise codes are a little bit more uh, lenient. I believe it's 62 decibels, um, and uh, we extended the uh, wall um, on the north side um, to include the area with the parking lot, um, and that will include a door. Uh, for access into the um, into the uh, play area. Um, last time it was also brought up uh, about what kind of effect the um, terrain or elevation would have on the barrier's effectiveness. Um, we looked into that um, and because uh, right at the property line, um, the, the nearest residential property line, um, it actually is, is slightly lower, uh, which is effectively raising the, the height of the barrier um, in practice. We, um, approaching this conservatively, um, this, th this does help our case uh, with, you know, it, it will provide a slightly more uh, attenuation. Um, and um, going to the, to the house, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the structures on Lincoln Street, um, it's um, similar, uh, a similar level of terrain, meaning that um, it's not going to affect the uh, effectiveness of the sound attenuation barrier. Um, so that, that uh, sort of concludes uh, my uh, initial presentation. Um, I've got, uh, this is, I believe, what, what you all have in, um, in front of you. So yes. the terrain going down, you mentioned there's the corner of your property that's lower than the property or the, you know, that corner of the wall. So that, that helps you, but the terrain interior to the dog play area that does go up. So is that two foot difference something that is taken into account in your model? Like yes. You, okay. Yes. Um, and it's like 30, it's 30 feet in about the mid area of the mm -hmm. dog play area. And then it gets down to 20. 28, 27, something like that in that uh, northeast corner. Yeah. So, so dealing specifically with the with the noise code, as as the the dogs 
are further away um, from the barrier. It, it, uh, we're benefiting from the, the distance um, from in attenuation. Um, it's roughly six decibels every, every doubling of distance. Um, uh, so if a dog is close, the barrier is more effective, but if a dog is far away from the, from the barrier, um, in, in both cases, the, the dog being further away, even though there is that slope, it will be. So uh, even though the effective height of the wall is nine feet, it's far, you're if the farther dog is, away, you're farther yeah. away, so it, exactly. it will Exactly, yes. What if this doesn't work? How do you guarantee it? Uh, well, um, I mean, to the <clears throat> satisfaction of the neighbors that have this uh, complaint. And, and so since that's probably going through other people's minds too, mine hmm. included, right? Let me just rephrase it and, and just say, what would you do next if possible, right? What we're struggling with, I, I suspect, I know I'm struggling with, is that there are other situations in town that we are dealing with this issue, and there's seemingly a lack of solution, right? And so uh, if we're, this were to go forward in, uh, you know, in six months from now, things are, are, are not any better for the residences nearby in their minds, right? Mm -hmm. What would you do next? What, what comes to mind? Um, and by the way, this question is as much posed to the owner as you, right? You're just going to yes. react, but they got to hear it. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I am very confident in these, in these calculations, just to, to start off before uh, we, we touch that scenario. Um, uh, I've seen this work. I, I've, uh, you know, in the, the examples that I've mentioned, um, uh, We've, we've seen it work successfully, this method of, of putting up a, a barrier and the calculation method that's used to, uh, to determine the required height, the required um, thickness of the barrier. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm confident, uh, my company is confident, I'm, I'm, my, uh, my math has been double and triple checked, not just by me, but, but by my colleagues as well. Um, so I, I am confident that it, that it will work. Um, Going to what uh, what would happen if for some reason that it did not work, um, the first thing I would investigate is is why it's not working and why in this situation um, the the barrier is not performing to the way that that we calculated. Um, if it's an obvious solution like the uh, the wall was not installed properly or there's major gaps between boards or something like that, then that would need to be addressed. Um, and uh, you know, in that situation, then we would just need to figure out why it's not working and, and fix whatever, whatever that is. Um, if there, I mean, I, yeah, obviously I, I've said I was, I was confident that it will work, but um, if we were to put it up and for some reason um, it were not to work, we would, the, the next step could be adding uh, mass, adding additional uh, weight to that wall um, it could be adding um, an additional uh, sound attenuation fin that can get us a couple decibels at the top. Um, but, but like I said, I, uh, I'm very confident that this will work. Okay. <clears throat> what do you mean by additional weight, adding weight? Yeah, so there's, a, there's, um, there's basically two ways that, that sound can get to um, a property when there's a wall in the way. The first is traveling directly through the wall. Um, you know, like I, I had mentioned last time, you know, <coughs> no matter what kind of uh, material you put in between um, a noise source and a receiver, there's going to be some amount of noise that goes through that barrier. Um, that's just, it's just, it's going to happen. Um, so, and then the other, the other part is uh, sound diffracting over the top. So when I perform this calculation, I need to account for sound that's going straight through the barrier, uh, called transmission loss, and sound that is going over the barrier, uh, called insertion loss. And uh, so you calculate both of those levels, and then you add them together, um, account for distance, um, possible uh, um, additional attenuation, although 
approaching this conservatively um, and you know wanting this to work and not wanting to have to come back again and, and figure out why it's not working um, I actually didn't uh, account for any additional absorption by trees or um, undergrowth or anything like that um, so you could hypothetically cut all this down and I'd still be cut all the trees down I'd still be confident that it would work the massing of I so, it's the oh thickness yeah. of the wall exactly right? the, the, the thickness of the wall of sorry going back to that question theoretically you could add thickness by adding another layer to the wall vertically. yes exactly yeah so um, if you were to add even like a, a mass loaded vinyl or something um, that wouldn't add much thickness but it would add density the the sound that's going through that wall the more massive you make it um, uh, you know if you want to soundproof a room you can use several layers of sheetrock in this case we'd use a more outdoor friendly uh, method like is, that so that there, that would be a hypothetical is there any rule of thumb if you're going down that route in terms of how many more decibels you could expect to improve and I realize it may depend on the type of material the thickness yeah so cetera, just accounting for the the um, sound that's going through if you were to thicken that wall or, or add mass to it it's not gonna it's not going to um, attenuate the diffracted sound but um, but you get an additional three decibels per doubling of mass and I guess another um, last time I think you gave some sort of general sense of what uh, it may not have been a 20 decibel reduction you might have been talking about a 17 or maybe you said for every 10 decibels something seems like half of what it is at yeah the, subjectively could you, could you um, reiterate of what course that is? Yeah. Uh, so one decibel is um, hypothetically what a human the, the minimum that a human can can detect a difference in um, and that's uh, supposedly like a newborn baby how they tested that baby I don't know but um, uh, one decibel is the difference but the the minimum difference that a human can hear uh, three decibels is noticeable uh, six decibels um, is or sorry three decibels is barely noticeable six decibels is noticeable and ten decibels is roughly a doubling um, subjectively a doubling of, so, uh, of volume so what is 20 gonna mean then 20 20 is a very significant reduction and the 20 is at exactly what point is that at the uh, <laughs> at the property line. times property line yes okay um, just just one point on page one of your addendum so the receive level for excited dogs if it's a 20 reduction would be uh, 52 rather than 50 I just want to make sure that I just think you were when you changed it I think it got transposed but so it would be 52 excited dogs 47 typical uh, yes the, okay. the levels on that did I is there a typo in my on this uh, on this one there is yeah not a, that's correct up here but ours has uh, on the chart it shows 50 so I think it should be 52 oh okay I apologize okay. for that um, and I guess can I just go back again to your your layering situation so mm -hmm. are there Are there at, at some point are there limits in terms of how much you can do with that? Do you get diminishing returns if you go, you know, twice as thick a layer versus uh, you know a single layer kind of thing? It, well, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's three decibels per uh, doubling of mass. So the first three decibels, if you were to put another um, two by uh, twelve on top of that wall, then then you're going to get um, an additional 3 dB out of that um, but then for the next three decibels you'd have to put another two layers on top of that you mean I just, I just had a question about um, if, let's say that I'm a neighbor further down probably mm -hmm. one of, I'm, I'm one of the neighbors that has has brought this to the attention of the town and um, the no the wall goes up um, perfectly designed and it's a sunny day and the windows are open in the summer mm -hmm. and I and I and there's excited dogs at, in the playground what do you think that I would be hearing would I be hearing what would be the difference in the sound in the volume of sound 
it, yeah, so, so um, let's take that one step further and just say you're outside and there's, outside. No, there's no windows, there's no, you're just outside on your porch and, and you're, you're totally open to the air. Um, uh, we'd see a, a 20 decibel reduction with the, the 10 foot two by 12 wall, which would subjectively, um, and again, it sounded a little subjective, but, um, but, but rule of thumb used throughout, uh, throughout my industry is, is uh, you would have the volume of the dogs and then have it again. Um, and by that point, um, especially if you were, were in the, um, uh, uh, the the residential area where, where, the, where the houses are, um, that would be really closely approaching the um, the ambient level, which would mean you would really need to. And on the on the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. if they're excited, you would and and it's a quiet day, you'd need to listen for it. Um, if the wind is blowing, if the there's traffic, if um, kids are playing, uh, I would be surprised if you heard it at all. That's much better than it is. Of course. I guess just to follow up on that, that was, that was something that I think I was trying to ask toward the end was, you know, not the immediate next door neighbor, but somebody a quarter mile away. Mm -hmm. Are they going to get the same 20 decibel benefit or does the benefit of the wall kind of diminish the further away you are? I mean, I live four miles from 91, and there's a wall, mm -hmm. but I can hear it. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's a good point. Um, when dealing with traffic, um, that noise does propagate a little bit differently. Um, because the source is moving, and it's in a line, and there's multiple sources, uh, it propagates um, more like a line uh, expanding rather than a point expanding. So... Um, it actually, the cars sort of reinforce that sound wave as it's as it's, as one car is driving along. It's creating kind of a cone um, in the way it emits sound, as opposed to um, uh, you know like a single point that's just um, evenly being distributed in, in all locations. That car reinforces the sound as it's going down. So um, traffic noise specifically, especially when you have multiple um, uh, you know road. Uh, tire noise and engine noise um, and all of that um, mixed in uh, traffic noise will travel much further than, than uh, dogs will. Um, uh, so the, um, to go back to your question of, of, of effectiveness, uh, the barrier uh, will, that, that 20 decibels um, will be the reduction of 20 decibels will be diminished a little bit the further you move away. Um, but still, uh, I think we ran the, um, the calculations and I, I believe, I have it written down, I believe it was um, uh, 42 decibels um, at the absolute loudest when you're, um, when you're at the actual structure of, of Lincoln um, and uh, at the 42 at the absolute absolute loudest and uh, and closer to 35 um, with the um, uh, at during under typical conditions so yes you will the the effectiveness of the barrier um, is slightly diminished at the further you move away but because you're moving away and because that uh, noise source is a point source rather than a line source, um, then you, you know, you're benefited from that from that uh, uh, distance. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that was that was kind of what I wanted to know, and I guess, you know, sort of the dilemma is that you're talking about kind of two separate yet related things. You're talking about the, you know, the quantity of decibels and so forth. But we're also talking about the the nuisance aspect of the mm -hmm. pervasive sound, mm -hmm. even if it does comply with the noise ordinance. And I guess what I what I wanted to know, and I, I think that's what you've explained, is that you know the the wall will s provide a substantial reduction in the quantitative amount of the noise, mm -hmm. even at a greater distance, so that the nuisance aspect should be diminished. Proportionately. Absolutely, yeah. It, it, it will significantly reduce, no matter where you are in that neighborhood, um, and even even uh, you know now in the other direction, uh, along the southern wall, along the northern wall, in, in all directions, 
um, all of them will be significantly benefited from this. Um, uh, and, um, you know, numbers wise, uh, the, the, that 20 decibels will not hold up the further you move away. Um, uh, but it, it, with the added distance, every, you know, it, it's going to be well over, uh, well over 10, um, closer to 16 decibels, even as you move further and further away. So, so thank you. It was that relativity that I was missing in the answer, right? You said max was 42-ish, if you're remembering your calculations mm -hmm. correctly, but what was it compared to? What would it be today? And I, I think what you're telling me is it's 16 I, or 15 more. Yes. Right? Yes. It may not be 20. Yes. But it's... Yeah, I believe it was 16. Uh, I, the, the, one of the furthest properties that I, that I ran that calculation for was, was a 16 decibel reduction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Could, could you just, I know it's on one of your slides, but the Weathersfield noise ordinance, could you reiterate with a residential receptor, what does it define as daytime hours versus nighttime hours? Uh, so yeah, at the bottom of that um, slide, daytime hours is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and 9 a.m. through 10 p.m. Um, okay. on Sunday. So, so just to be clear, from it, if you were prior to 7 a.m. on a Monday through Saturday, you would be at the evening more restrictive decibel max of 45 correct yes correct okay and under your under your analysis with the 10 foot tall and the 20 f decibel reduction um, both the excited or the typical dogs would be slightly over yes the, the, over the nighttime level yeah it so. would it would be a matter of operation um, of, of not letting any dogs out before 7 a.m. Right, and I think they said they're I'm just trying to find here their hours of. I think they said they open at six a.m. on uh, on weekdays, and I think they said they were only open on Saturdays and not on Sundays. Is that correct? Okay, but I think it would be based on their own analysis. I just think it would be important that they not put dogs outside during what are defined as evening hours under the ordinance <coughs> thank you Jeff. that's correct yes which is pretty difficult when you're dropping a dog off and it's excited and it's gets to go play and it's not a whole group of dogs it's the one point that's right there that's not within the enclosure it's just a challenging situation <coughs> i feel like that's could be a source of nuisance for the neighborhood but so as opposed to just hourly stuff it's just a product of bringing the dog to the property is is a challenge. Not that I'm suggesting that it's a possible good or possible solution. I'm just trying to right. like just if you if you hear a dog barking at six thirty in the morning, it's not because they're all outside. It's because you're dropping one off and it's just to see his friends. That's all. Right. Yeah, I guess my, my point is simply I don't think you should have this whole backyard run prior to seven AM hypothetically on a weekday or according to this analysis, they would not be compliant with the nighttime noise standard. True. <coughs> but then neither, neither might your neighbor, right? Neither might your neighbor who puts the dog out, right? Well, that's true. Right, so, so I just wondered if it's 40 versus. Mm. Yeah, right, oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it's, it's one we versus. We don't have to give a special permit to your neighbor to have a dog. No. <laughs> <laughs> George? Yeah, uh, my question, Feed answered the technical aspect of it. I'm more concerned with the owners and their representative lawyer, Ms. Pearson, uh, what they would do if this doesn't work out. Okay. And the, the, you know, I got the technical aspect. Yep. I understand that. Fair enough. And then I have another question. Um, and this is because I'm not an engineer. What <laughs> What is this? Uh, trench and how does it work that that could be after the, the issue of the dollar trench is made. Sure. I'd like somebody to explain what each of those does and is. Sure. I think we can get to that w when the owner's up here probably too, right? Do we have additional questions for the uh, acoustical engineer? Tony. Just one more. Your yes. slide had a November date on it. Um, you only did the inspection on that one date. Is that correct? September and, uh, 20, uh, yes. 
24. Uh, a, mid, a midday inspection for t over two hours? Yes. Uh, would, it, would it have mattered if it was 8.30 in the morning or 4.30 in the afternoon with traffic, background noise, or low clouds overhead? Does that come into play on the sound and the acoustical analysis? Um, yeah, so the, the reason we did the background um, noise measurement was to make sure that we were exceeding the, back, the background noise level. Um, when we hit the clock results... Uh, so uh, the average background level was around 56 decibels, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were hitting accurate levels. Um, so the 71.9 decibels that, that we sort of based everything off of um, uh, was over the ambient level, which, which just essentially means that we know we have accurate data uh, to work with. What would you expect as a difference on like a 30 degree day versus a 90 degree day? Um, in terms of uh, background noise? What you would hear, not background noise, but just like a point, a point sound in the dog area, like would it travel farther because the air is more dense? Or? Um, on a... I'm just, I'm just a, curious a warmer it would be like one decibel uh, difference. Or yeah, a, a warmer day um, would, would uh, be better uh, because it actually, the, the earth is warm and this, the sound will actually mm. uh, curve up towards the sky. Um, when we do these calculations, we, we assume that it's, it's uh, stagnant, that it, the, the air is not a gradient, that it's traveling um, as if it were a, a cold day. Um, I don't know exactly the decibel difference on a very hot day, but, um, but we assume that it's... Um, so it has more to do with the air or the Earth's temperature as opposed to the... That's interesting. It, yeah, right. yeah. Sorry, I know. Yeah, I was going to say, it's it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, thanks. Um, just to make sure I understand correctly, your your background levels of dogs, both the excited and the not excited, was based on forty five dogs approximately being outside at the time you tested. Is that right? Uh, yes, there was uh, about I think forty five to fifty. Is, so, is just out of curiosity, if there were. You know, if there were 10 and not 40 or 20 and not 40 at any particular time where you were doing the same kind of test, mm -hmm. would that reduction in the number of dogs have a significant effect in reducing the, the decibel level? Um, so another rule of thumb is, uh, is that when you double the sources, you will get another six decibels of noise. So when you half the sources, you'll reduce it by, by six decibels, which, um, which I've mentioned before is uh, noticeable. Um, that being said, uh, I think it more depends on the, the dog that's out there. Um, if you could have 10 rambunctious dogs and you could have uh, 60 very quiet, calm dogs. But you, you feel confident that when you were there, that was a representative sample of what you would encounter there? Yeah, when I was when I was standing outside of the barrier, um, and I have, uh, let's see, I've got a picture of it. Um, all those dogs in that picture all the way to the right uh, were simultaneously barking. Um, uh, I didn't really get a picture of them. Well, you can see some of them are barking, but, um, but, but yeah, they were, they were all uh, running over, curious uh, who who I was, what I was doing there, uh, and, and and barking simultaneously. So I, I have a strong level of confidence that I got um, what what would be the worst case scenario. Um, and then adding to that, we did we did take that was the loudest point throughout the entire uh, measurement of of, uh, of a couple hours. So thank you. So we'll move back to the uh, applicant. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. So before we get to the public again, let's dig into your question about the trench, which I think I could answer, but I'll let the applicant answer, right? Uh, what else did we want to hear about? So let's start with the trench, and if you heard anything that you want to respond to. <coughs> with regard to the trench, um, the town engineer asked that, uh, let me 
Peter, would the town engineer's report be in this? Yes, it was submitted as part of this. The town engineer asked that the applicant design a, uh, uh, an infiltration trench or infiltration basin below the play area, which would be designed, he required, in accordance with the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual to accept runoff um, water that they, they have a hose out there, they, they clean off the, uh, the surface for... It goes into the trench for the gravel? Yes, and it sinks and down, water. it sinks down, the, it's, it's cleaned because it's in the ground. So it, it, by virtue of it going into the ground, it's low impact development kind of technique to control stormwater. The 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Manual has requirements for um, dealing with stormwater runoff that is uh, not purely clean in one way or the other. It could be oil and grease from and a parking town lot. Engineer accepted this and yes. Inland wetland people did. Correct. In other words, because it is serious uh, runoff, it's just not rainwater or earth. No, it's run what's ever left on land. the other than. Um, hard material, which is not disposed of that way. But if, uh, if there's any urine that's on there, it gets washed into this it's infiltration vessel. Yeah. Yes, and it goes down into the ground where it's cleansed of anything that uh, is an issue in so accordance with the- is this uh, material? Uh, I do have the plan. I will pull it out and check. Approximately 36 inches. You have it right there, 36 yeah, inches? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's in the middle of this. About three inches. But again, it was- oh, okay. It was designed in accordance with the manual, and the, um, Jim Cassidy is our engineer with uh, Palisy and, and uh, <coughs> Pearson and Cassidy, and he worked closely with the town engineer to design it. Um, there was some give and take, and they made some changes and upgrades, and uh, the engineer ultimately signed off on it, and the Inland Wetland Agency was quite satisfied. So I. I was hoping I didn't need him to come this evening, <laughs> and I'm hoping, given that the inland wetland approval is part of the record with regard to floodplain impacts, that I was more interested not in what inland wetland they approved it, but I want to know how and what it, it works. How it works. Yeah. I'm sorry I missed that. I and the town <coughs> engineer, everything is run. No. Yes. So, so George, you had a, a question for the applicant about um, what if. <coughs> So would you like to? Sure. Um, I frankly take great comfort from what our sound uh, expert has said that, you know, with the experience of his firm with regard to other sound attenuation walls and everything that he has learned about this site and um, the worst case scenario with barking dogs out there, he is certainly quite comfortable that this is going to work. W I would suggest that we do a follow-up study um, six months, um, three months after it's up. I, I would think you'd want something during the summer when people are outside. Um, you're going to know very quickly from the neighbors whether if, if it's not working, they're going to tell you. But we will also do a study to, to document under the same scenario, and Tuesday, we chose to Tuesday for our study this time because it is the, our highest peak time um, when they have the most dogs on the site, and uh, we will replicate the same conditions as were in place when that was done before <coughs> and, and take uh, measurements for you. If for some reason it is not working, and we should know that very quickly, frankly, even without doing the study. Um, but we will commit to coming back. And if there is, um, if it is not working, you've heard our sound experts say there are still additional things that could be done, and the applicant will have to do them because, you know, and you're. And you want that as part of the conditions. That we will come back and we will do a sound test after six months seems to be a reasonable time, but we can make it shorter if you would prefer to do that. We think if you were to approve it tonight that we could get this installed before the ground gets too hard. Uh, we think we have a month window here before hard freeze and it's, it's not possible to do it. 
um, and we would certainly pursue it as soon as possible to get it done this winter. If not, if, if the ground is, is too frozen to do, because the infiltration trench has to be dug first. If, if for some reason we cannot do it, then we do it first thing in the spring. Um, and we would commit to coming back and coming up with and other solutions and making it work. Now, a special <coughs> permit, you know, is something that does run with the land, but you are able to impose conditions on your special permit, and you can uh, uh, impose a condition that requires us to test and to come back and to achieve levels that bring that sound below your noise levels so that, uh, you know, the, the, the neighbors are not experiencing a nuisance. I mean, frankly, ultimately get to the point where you have to cover the outdoor area. That's certainly a possibility. It negates the ability to have an outdoor area for the dogs. Um, but there are things that could be done should they prove necessary. Again, we're relying, none of us are experts, and we do have an expert here who has told you that there's no reason to think that this will not be able to work. And if assuming that's the case, and assuming our expert is correct, you would then have a situation where you would have uh, a special permit approval that has requirements in it to eliminate significantly the nuisance factor that the, uh, or reduce significantly the nuisance factor that the neighbors have complained to you about. And we don't, we don't doubt that they've experienced an unpleasant situation, but we are at the point where we can fix that. And uh, I don't, given that, the fact that mm -hmm. it can be fixed, I know there were some neighbors that said, look, you should, uh, there was one comment to the extent sort of that they didn't get an approval initially, so you shouldn't approve it now. But as you're aware, you know, property owners have the right to make additional improvements to their property, come back to boards and commissions to be able to do that. They have gone through the process now for the special permit. You do have criteria for a special permit, and I, I did write up some findings, but um, I'll, I'll leave those with you. But um, the gist of what you need to be able to be comfortable with is our proposal is one that solves the compatibility issue because the, the biggest criteria of your special permit regulations um, with regard to this particular use, because we're not dealing with traffic or any issues such as that, is whether or not the two uses can be compatible. This commercial use with the neighborhood uh, uh, behind it to the east, and if we control for the noise, there's really no way this property, if used the way my clients want to use it, is going to interfere with their enjoyment of their, of their private homes. Um, the fence is um, going to be a wood fence, 10 feet solid. It'll be, uh, uh, they're so far away in the back, there will be no aesthetic issues for them, and there's an intervening wooded area along the railroad track between the back of our property and, and the neighbors, the closest one being 33 Lincoln on the other side. Um, so aesthetically, no issues, and if we solve the sound issue, that is the only issue really that we've got before us right here is sound attenuation. And uh, we have a proposal to do that. So given all of that, shall we, uh, I'll go through my findings after the neighbors have a, oh, I do have one other thing I wanted to leave with you. And after the last uh, meeting, I know you asked my clients whether or not uh, the business could work without having an outdoor play area. And I know that um, you did ask um, some of those who spoke in favor of the application what was important to them about this business. And I think one of the things you were trying to get to is whether or not they needed this outdoor play area. I think if you'd asked them that question, they would have said, oh my gosh, yes, of course. Um, that's, that's why we go there, that's part of it. But all the best ones in the area also have those outdoor play areas. And I'm going to leave you with a list of 12 area facilities, which my clients said are comparable to their business and their business model in other towns um, where there is this outdoor element, which is key. Is out, people want to be able to let their dog play outside during the day with other dogs mm -hmm. to exhaust themselves and have a good time. And uh, that, that is a key component of this business. So I would just like to toss that in as 
Any questions for the applicant? Do you know if those other businesses are open from 8 to 5 or 8 to 7, and do they allow up to 60 dogs in the outside facilities? Are they truly comparable? Um, I'm going to look at my client and ask if uh, <laughs> either of you would like to come up, because I have no idea. If either of you would like to come up and, and say what you might know about those businesses. This is Brian Cousin. Good evening, gentlemen. Yeah, um, yeah of the 12, oh, I'm sorry, Brian Cousins. <clears throat> um, of the 12 that we submitted, um, all of them are within a 20 mile radius. And um, I believe Candlewick Kennels is one of the ones that are there. They do over 200 dogs. Um, Best Friends is on the Rocky Hill border and they actually board 150 dogs. So as far as daycare and boarding, they're more than comparable. There's two on there that are smaller. There's the uh, dog cabin and um, Doggy Palace, I think, and both of those are smaller units, but they still do have an outside area and they do have um, boarding and daycare. Thank you. I have a quick, while he's up, if yep. you mm -hmm. go ahead. Mr. Cousins, quick question. I hadn't, I, I looked back at your application, which I hadn't looked at since last meeting, and just one question is, is there a staggered sort of drop-off period every morning, or is it over a two-hour period? How does that work generally? <laughs> or could they come in, you know, at, at noon with a dog even? Is and it, they do. Um, okay. Because we do uh, full days and half days. And okay. a half day is six hours or less. And it's any six hours. There's not a, a okay. specific time. So there'll be, the majority come between probably seven and eight. Um, there's very few that come in between six and seven. It's usually people that, um, school teachers or people that have to be in work for, obviously, for seven. Um, <clears throat> and what our procedure is with those are, the dogs are, once they're inside the building, they're brought outside individually to go to the bathroom and then come in. There's no guarantee that the dog's not gonna bark from the mm -hmm. car to the front door or when it's outside. But we tr try to eliminate any kind of excitement in the sense of we don't let them go in a whole big group and get all crazy in the morning. So we kind of let them do that, then they go inside and they're inside one of the indoor playrooms until, um, we try quarter to eight, eight o'clock before we start letting the group out. But I can do like an algorithm with our um, program system and see how many are actually there between six and 6.30, 6.30 and seven. We didn't do that, but there's very few from six to seven that get dropped off for daycare. The, the majority are after seven. So, so, so even, I see what you're saying. So it, prior to the 7.45 to eight o'clock, you're sort of taking them out individually on an as needed They'll basis. go out one or two at a time um, and there's somebody out there and it's usually for a few minutes to let them pee. If, if and when you, say that the, the when you say the pack is inside until 7.50 to eight, that means a, a the big group. Everyone. Correct, all the ones that are coming in, like if you came in at six and then someone else came in at 6.15, they're all put together in one room inside or, or two rooms inside. So the bottom, you don't, you don't put out a big group before 7 we a.m. on a weekday or something? Correct, never. Okay. There's never a big group out there at six, at six thirty or seven o'clock. Okay. We don't even have a big group at that point. Okay. And pickups, just to add to this, they're picked up throughout the day, so they're dropped off anytime during the day, and they're also picked up anytime during the day. So there's really not a textbook way of saying there's this many at this time and this many. The average are dropped off between seven and eight, and usually picked up between three thirty and four thirty or five. A lot of the teachers are picked up, the dogs are picked up by like three. My notes here, I f I'm just forgetting. How many board? How many can you keep overnight? We, um, we don't ever board more than 20, um, but there's no, the state does not have a, okay. um, a limit of how many we can. Our facility can do up to 20 and that's, we've never even had that many as far as boarding. You know, it just occurred to me, there's one, of, well, they may have another question. Mm -hmm. um, the business next door is a dog grooming place. So in terms of compatibility, and that's the one to the south, that business, I mean, you, there was some concern expressed about dogs getting out of the car and going into the building. And the business right next door is dogs getting out of the car and going into the building. So I mean, there's, there, it, it's a dog compatible area right there, um, which is one of the reasons we hadn't even thought about putting the fence initially on the south side 
because the owner of that facility, actually you said she's a client of yours also, but is very supportive of, of the business that the cousins are operating next door to. But someone here mentioned that maybe it would be a good idea to put it on the south side because you also never know what business might be in there in the future. So we, we've done that. Right. Thank you. So at this point I'm going to ask you to sure. get off your feet and we'll invite the public up to express points of view. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Good evening, Kieran Williams, 149 Garden Street. I'm gonna preface my comments by saying I'm not here to be adversarial. I'm not here to be argumentative. I would like to have this discussed in a reasonable, common sense way. So when I wander off that path, come gavel me or something, <laughs> okay? I, I really was not quite sure how I wanted to do this until this particular meeting. And I, I really would like to go in two parts. The first, and as my kids said, be brief before they throw you out. Um, There was kind of a semi-mystery uh, when this started, and I would like to point out, we are now in the ninth month of this issue. Nine months. Not all your fault. Uh, I was laughing with someone that when I first addressed you a couple of meetings ago, half of you looked at me with a glazed look in your eye, and the other half was saying, what the hell is he talking about? You guys didn't, weren't even involved, didn't even know about the previous six, seven months of uh, shenanigans we played with the, the town officials. But it turns out there was an individual, who was a zoning manager, I believe, um, is his title. He determined this application all by himself. He felt that there was, since there was no change in the use, he decided there's no need to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now, under the statute you guys have, a veterinary and a kennel is in fact under the same umbrella. Are they similar business? Not at all. A veterinary is a person trained and authorized to practice veterinary medicine and surgery, a doctor of veterinary medicine. A person who holds an academic degree in veterinary medicine, a licensed practitioner of veterinary medicine, and a kennel, a house or shelter for a dog or cat. We're talking cherries and watermelons here. Often kennels are established where dogs or cats are bred, raised, trained, or boarded. They're not the same businesses. Dr. Hallisey, which I've told you before, <clears throat> was turned down on an application where he wanted to have single individual pens put out there. He was turned down. Is it a commercial application where it is? Yes. Is it border a, a neighbor? Neighborhoods? Yes. Should we look at this with, with a thorough review of, of what we're thinking about? So there was no public hearing. This application was never presented to the PNZ Commission for review and analysis. Yet he, and only he, approved this application. I don't think that's quite fair. I don't think that's the way a town should be operating. When that application was submitted, or even as you should be looking at this, I understand the, the, if the correct word is special, what is it? Permit. Special permit, thank you. Um, situation that has gone on for nine months with Wagtail is intolerable and wholly mm -hmm. unacceptable. We've lived in a crap situation far, far, far too long. The noise, not constant, continuous, crazy. We hear the fighting. We hear the kids yelling at them. We hear the dogs going and going and going even before 
they were supposed to and after they're supposed to. Um, I got kind of mocked when I talked about a pack mentality last session. Well, a dog got attacked last week. He's got severe wounds in his neck. This happened at their place. The person who wrote this on net for Weathersfield or whatever it is, said it took f uh, four days, no response. Four phone calls, no response. A Facebook entry, no response. Ultimately, and I'm quoting her, ultimately, and you can look it up, she said a person called and she got you know, an explanation. Brian then called. And she said she got kind of a different information. So she wasn't comfortable with what she heard. That is a pack mentality. So under special permit, uh, what should have been asked before, I think, did the application clearly state day and overnight boarding of dogs? Did the application state time of operation? Did the application, which I now hear is what, 7.45, 8 o'clock? I mean, this is for you guys to, to figure out. Uh, the original application did not include an outdoor run. The application did not include plot plan changes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here in front of you. So um, did the town notify area residents who could be impacted? Did the town place any limitations to how many dogs could be allowed? Did the town discuss any wetlands considerations such as fecal and urine runoff? And I think that's been addressed, finally, thanks to you guys. Did the town discuss noise control? What parameters did the town impose on the initial application or subsequent application, now, contingencies? Did they limit the size of the dog run? Did they impose any restriction on how many dogs can be out at one time? 40 dogs? Pack mentality? Noise? I don't think that's fair. How long can they go out? How many times a day? Should it be five or six who can go out at a time and not 40? You guys are gonna have to decide that. Um, we have a situation where we've got a dog pound right in our backyards. I've said this to you before, I challenge any one of you who would vote to have that put four or five houses away from you and have that kind of noise continually all week long. Now our issue mainly is really one of nuisance control, which is you are not the advocates of that, it's the police department who have failed miserably in supporting this. Mitney, Lieutenant Mitney, who's no longer in that position, she's Lieutenant Conley now, um, stated back in October to me that they had 25 complaints, one citation, two warnings. That doesn't seem right. They have two part-time ACOs. Otherwise, the police people, uh, policemen or women who are on duty have to do the inspection themselves. So we call, and no one calls in the first bark, but after an hour, you call and say, okay, that's enough. Send somebody down, please. But do you think the police go right there and do it? Or as I said, it's not 24 hours a day, but it's in sessions. So what if they get there and there's no dogs? So how do we prove or disprove what's been going on? We uh, have a number of situations that, uh, the one issue is the police in regard to nuisance ordinance compliance and complaints. It's not with you guys. You're the approval process. You're the ones who have to be our guardians. You have to be looking after everybody's interest, a business as well as does it impact on the residents. 
but I think that's fair. And I think it should be fair and balanced and researched thoroughly. And there should be a way, we've been begging for a way to find compliance. It doesn't take nine months for us of complaining. It took nine months of stalling and delaying and, and making up stories to the town officials and the town officials dragging their, their heels. They pass the buck to this one, then we find out it's not him, it's them. And you know we get bounced around. Nine months. You can't be proud of a town that takes nine months when neighborhoods of families and homes <coughs> are so negatively impacted. Um, you, could, you could state the question, how could you approve an application that's going to produce nuisance ordinance violations? With all due respect, we've not heard any guarantee. We've heard, am I correct, there's going to be a third wall now? Mm -hmm. All three walls now? Three sides. Yeah. Three sides, excuse me. Three sides. Um, never once, not once, were you afforded the professional courtesy of a response from Charles Morrison. Never responded to our request for a review and cease and desist until we could resolve this. We, the neighborhood, had to put up with the obnoxious, continual barking noise, which at times is just crazy, and the length of times of these sessions is, is obnoxious. We were told if there is a particular dog or dogs who are uh, really bad performers, for lack of a better word, they would be asked to leave. Well, there's one dog we all know about, including the town people, so I know who you're talking about. You're talking about this guy here. Why the hell is he still there? We've been told a lot of stories from these fine people. Not one of it happens. Nothing. Not a thing. The issue of <clears throat> compliance, which is our issue with you guys. You all have this. I've all presented to you before. Public nuisance. You know what it is? Barks, whines, howls, or makes any noise natural to its species in an excessive or continuous fashion so as not to disturb the peace except where act such activity occurs on a farm. And then I can quote you or read you, but I believe, since it's the crux of the matter, you know about 70-3 nuisance. You know about 70.5 administrative sanctions and remedies. You know this stuff. What we need you to do is to find the ways that this is going to work. How is it going to work? Should we have 40 dogs out there or should we have four or 10? Should they be out there for an hour or whatever it is? Should they be there, five or six of them, for 10, 15 minutes? I don't pee eight times a day. I don't think a dog needs to go out eight times a day. And if they were left at home, they wouldn't be let out eight times a day. There are two towns, and I forget them, but I'll, if, if you need, I will look them up. There are two towns within this area that do not allow outside kennels. And I can't tell that it's apples to apples where these others have a hundred dogs or what. You can say it, but how do we know it's a fair comparison? I don't, they don't, you guys don't. You know, <coughs> I'm speaking for me, I shouldn't pretend to, to besmirch my neighbors. I just don't feel you guys are hearing us or feeling it. I really don't. I honestly God don't. You don't know the hell of listening all week long to barking, romping, playing dogs, fighting dogs. You don't you don't understand it. It's just unbelievable. We can't make this stuff up. 
and, and the feeling is that the business is more important than the residents. That's my feeling. I can't speak, I shouldn't speak for others. You know, yes, sir. Do you think the proposal as presented will work to extend your No, consent? I'll tell you why. why. For several reasons. Will it help? I suspect it will. My first thought would be, sir, who is any of us to mitigate what's acceptable noise in the terms of nuisance for others to have to live within? Pardon me. The second is, uh, and I spoke to a state official, former, and I researched it, those 16-foot highway barriers, and this gentleman mentioned twice, sound goes over walls. It's great for the first 50 feet, and it stinks. Well, I shouldn't say it stinks. It still goes on to all of those over 50 feet. Um, I think, me personally, that if we're going to, if they're going to do something, which I respect, then it all should be done now. I don't want to hear, well, we'll come revisit it in six months. That doesn't fly. We've already done nine months. What can they do to ensure, and I've said it before, there's one choice, there's two choices, and close it with a roof or not be allowed to have dogs out there. Now those are two extremes. So what would be a fair compromise? If a 10 foot wall is better than an eight foot wall, wouldn't a 12 foot wall be more effective than a 10 foot wall? What if you put a canvas dome on aluminum poles over the top to encapsulate sound this way? Nine months, kids. It's, it's been it's a horror story. It really is. Now, we do have three sides. That's an improvement. And I recall saying uh, our guys feeling that a two-sided, two, two walls doesn't make sense when the third is open facing Deerfield and Dorchester. How high? I don't know. I say 12 is better than 10. They say the state of Connecticut, 16 foot highway barriers, sound travels over the barrier. This gentleman says sound goes over the barrier. Um, what if it doesn't work? Then what? Did they waste their money? Which I don't advocate. Do we endure another? First of all, six months is wrong. Th three months would be more appropriate, in my opinion. And, and not just one day of testing. Trust me, there are days and times that it's just crazier than others. Who's to say that wasn't just a, you know, in our opinion, for what we've lived in, an okay day, as opposed to some of the absolutely horrendous days. Um, I did some research quite a bit, noise absorption materials are very highly thought of by uh, different companies in different situations. Be that mats, I'm not sure what it is. You know, they, in this case, several of them talked about mats. Uh, these things that they're supposed to do, who's going to sign off on them? Who's going, you guys going to sign off on them? Is the town engineer going to sign off? How do we know that trench is built exactly the way it's supposed to be? Who inspects those walls? Who is, uh, who is responsible for signing off and saying this was done correctly? I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I've bored you guys to tears a number of times. And, um, you know, uh, w there was one meeting where people spoke in support of, of the place, and that's terrific, but it's not relevant to the issue. The issue is nuisance noise control. I'll take their word that it's great, great place, great people. I hope to hell it's true. 
but we're going to pick dogs being allowed to romp and roll in 40, 45, 50, 60. What's the limit? What if they grow to 100? Then that barrier is going to work. It's got to be controlled, top and size, or not at all. And, and when I said to you originally, um, I believe you guys are in a pickle. And I think you're in a pickle because proper and due diligence wasn't followed initially. One guy makes a decision of this magnitude, you guys, several, many, some of you, whatever the right word is, didn't even know about it. And it was not presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It was slipped in under the radar. So now we're here talking after the fact. And I don't believe the claim, I don't trust the complaint, would be a fair way of saying it, that his business fails if he doesn't have an outdoor pen. So think of the uh, home devaluation. Think of having to listen to this heinous noise constantly. Think about the nuisance that, again, because this wasn't done right, the pickle is, well, how do we make this work? The police aren't doing their job. The town manager bounced us from here to there to everywhere. And only did we finally get to a number of the right people and we're now in the ninth month. And we waited nine months. I don't care if they have a builder who can start tomorrow. I don't believe this should be passed this evening. I do believe a number of questions that we've raised, or more importantly, you as the experts might want to look at and consider in a fair and proper evaluation and purview of the facts that you could come to a, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> excuse me, reasonable conclusion. That makes sense. That protects us. We don't have anybody else. You guys have to be the ones that do it for us. And not to the exclusion or, or loss of, his, of their business, but it started wrong. For nine months, it's been worked wrong. And we have the opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, with your assistance to make it right. If we're going to do stuff, do everything we possibly can now. And if it doesn't work in 30 days, then you really, your decision be made for you. It ain't working. What else can you do? Give us a taller wall. Give us the mats now. We got the third side. We've got the drainage ditch. So it's not you who are going to save us. We're sunk. Not save us, but come to an honest review and analysis. You can't, have, well, I suggest you should not pass this this evening because you haven't answered all these questions. You haven't had a chance to debate all these questions and ask yourself, what are the protection measures necessary to this gentleman's point, how do we make it as goof-proof or, or uh, close to 100% effective as possible? And having done those steps, what are the contingencies? What are the limitations? What are the, the riders you put in that it will be inspected in 30 days? It will meet this criteria. You know, how many dogs? What are the hours? How many out at a time? There's right now, they come and go and do as they damn well please and have for all this time. And my family and our friends and neighbors paid the price. Do you have any questions of me? Thank you very Seeing much. Seeing none, thank you. <coughs> yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Eileen McCormick and I live at 143 Garden Street. And I did have a whole little thing written up, but Karen mentioned most of it. But I just have to say, I agree with Karen 100%. If this application gets through tonight, us as residents have no recourse. We're gonna get back here in three months and kind of 
throw it around again for a few more months. We lost the entire year listening to dogs barking around the clock. Inside, outside, company over, Sunday mornings, seven days a week. So I ask, again, that there have to be some limitations. And like he said, we have to know that this is going to work. I know the gentleman said over and over he's confident that it's going to work. There's no guarantees, and then we're stuck listening to it again for several months. So really, think about this if it was in your backyard. How would you feel? Would you want a board to just pass it and then say, well, we'll come back in a few months and look at it? Then once the application is done, it's done. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Dave McCormick, 143 Garden Street. Uh, a while back, I called the Best Friends Dog Play Care and Boarding Kennel on <coughs> Celestine Highway because I, I looked at the webcams, and they have three webcams set up, two rooms with dogs in them, and an outside area. The outside area was always empty. So two days in a row, I looked at it, nobody outside. <coughs> so I called up and said, you know, if I board my dog there, do they ever go outside? Because I see your webcam and nobody's outside. So the girl told me that daycare dogs go out for one hour a day, and if they're boarding, they go out four times a day. So this s nonsense that they have to be out 12 hours a day <coughs> is crazy. The business can be quite successful with limitations. Last time you asked the lawyer, one of you, if you would limit the hours. No. No give and take. Those are our hours and we're sticking to them. So there has to be some restrictions put on these hours. This, this past Sunday, 6, 10 a.m., dogs were outside barking. 20 minutes, not very long, but they're out there. And they know they're doing it, and they have no regard for the regulations or the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, this woman first. Robin Barasa, 248 Dale Road. Um, I've learned a lot um, about planning and zoning. Um, I have um, a lot of information, a lot of respect for what you guys and women have to decide and do for everybody's well-being in our town. And I've walked away from last the last meeting really trying to be empathetic to the neighbors. Um, my grandfather lived in Old Weathersfield um, for 40 years. Um, right near Hamner School um, by Solomon Wells. Um, so I was really trying to put myself in his shoes, although he wasn't that close to Silas Dean Highway. Um, and I was really trying to think, I'm, and I'm sure what you guys hear and feel is, is probably, it's very difficult. But uh, what I also know, um, Old Weathersfield butts up against 91. And for many, many years, there weren't any barriers. Um, and people, when they move someplace, you look at your surroundings. And their neighborhood, unfortunately, butts up to businesses and a business zone. Um, there's a lot of homes. People choose to buy homes sometimes near schools for the convenience. A lot of times, they choose not to purchase a home near a school for obvious reasons. Kids go out throughout the day for recess, noise throughout the day. Yes, kids <laughs> laughing is always a very pleasant sound. Um, but I think a lot of people, especially older homeowners, probably now realize the amount of traffic has grown exponentially near schools. Um, I'm sure they're not particularly happy about that. Um, I can remember t 15, 10, 15 years ago when people were um, very upset with the lights going on the football field. I, and I can understand that. Maybe there were there are five home games, um, and there was a lot of discussion, and, and obviously they voted in favor. I guess the point I'm I'm trying to get at with with an enormous amount of sensitivity is that when you purchase a home, you look at your surroundings and where you're going to be living, and if you want to live near a business zone, a school zone, a firehouse, there's quite a bit of noise that occurs. It's an evolution of growth, bad or good. Um, 
I failed to mention that the second time I mentioned that when we bring our dog to wag time, play and stay, um, the big reason for us is that Harley gets to go outside. Um, that is the honest to goodness truth. We don't have a fenced in yard, we walk her, um, but she gets to go outside and have fresh air. She loves the outside um, and she does romp around and play and um, as someone that grew up with dogs, I know the difference between dog fighting and, and not dog fighting. I had to educate my husband on the different sounds. And dogs do get angry with one another. Um, I also know that Harley is not kept outside for six hours straight. She is brought inside, she's brought out. Um, one of the reasons we chose not to go to Best Friends is that our last dog, um, they didn't care for the dog the way that Harley's taken care of at WAG time. And that is even going back a year and a half before any of this um, situation occurred. Um, I think the cousins, um, the brothers, and their parents um, are very vested in this community. They're very vested in the people that bring their dogs to their business. They're very caring. Um, I'm assuming they, besides purchasing the property, have invested tens of thousands of dollars and do and will do whatever it takes so that they can work harmoniously in the neighborhood um, that they're in. Um, I, the other point I wanted to bring up is, and I would never denounce this because we love our vet, but AA also kennels dogs there. Um, our previous dog had been there a couple times. When I pull up, uh, um, the dogs are outside. There's several dogs outside. Um, and they are very close to neighbors. Um, I, I'm sure Andrea, decades ago, probably put in for a kennel option. I'm not sure how that works, but dogs are always barking when I pull up there. Um, I just think that, I hope that you guys will understand that I do believe the cousins in Wagtime are willing to work together. I think we have a very successful, thriving business, which is really good for the town. and. Um, the clients that bring our dogs there, um, I would guess now 99% of them are very happy. Um, yes, there will be situations with dogs. Um, there always are. Um, uh, but I hope going forward that you guys will consider um, their proposal and that you will vote in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Some other people. So, some other people. Everybody have a turn. Donna Duffy, 21, 27 Lincoln Road, um, right next to 33. Um, all summer, I have had to um, leave, physically leave my home to get some peace. Um, during this past summer, the barking started 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and would go on till 7 p.m. Not consistently but continuously throughout the day, whether it's four dogs, 12 dogs, or 100 dogs. And trust me, it sounds like the hounds of hell when you're sitting, you're trying to be in your backyard. I was not able to use my backyard. I was not able to have any people over because of the noise. I'm hoping to be able to do that next summer. I'm going to ask that you reconsider this application, at least for tonight, because there are no benchmarks. We're, we hear from um, the applicant that, yes, we'll revisit this. We've been revisiting this for nine months, and I'm frankly really tired of it. I moved here 20 years ago. We did have the veterinary hospital there. Not once in the entire time that they were there did we ever have an issue with any kind of noise. So I'm asking you to please reconsider this application. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on, sweetheart. In the back. Yep. Yeah. 
Good evening. Mike Barasa, 248 Dale Road. And the one thing that I learned tonight, if that wall works and the sound system works as well as he says it does, I want to install that in my home from when my daughters come home from college. That's <laughs> the one thing that I learned tonight. But in, in all serious, and Karen said it earlier, <clears throat> it's not to um, dispute any of your concerns, because uh, as my wife said, we are very empathetic. But the last meeting, you know, I, I heard uh, some of the residents that were opposed to the plan talk about the dog noise in the morning and continuous all day. And I, I'm not a person that gets up in front of someone unless I know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and I'm not saying it's concrete, but I did my own investigation. Now, they were saying that the dogs were barking at seven in the morning. So I started taking my dog down to wag time at seven in the morning. And I would sit there for a little bit and the dogs were inside. I didn't hear any dog noise. I started driving down on Gardner Street and Lincoln Street and walking around at different times. So if you saw a white SUV, it wasn't a weirdo. <laughs> it was, I was just seeing if I could hear the dogs barking. And there were dogs barking, but they weren't coming from wag time. It was people walking their dogs. Every Sunday we go to Aroma Bistro early in the morning and we do a drive-by. I'm not hearing it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the times that I went down there, which was several, it, it wasn't going on. Now, is it, is it, could it be an issue? I, I, I think the neighbors have some concerns, absolutely. But for Brian to step up and do everything that is being asked, you know, I, I think it's going to be, I'm hoping that it will work and that you allow it to give it a chance because I think nuisance and annoyance is very subjective. Robin talked about the football field and that was very contentious. I think it was a great thing uh, by putting that field in. You know, there's, there's other businesses in the area. She talked about the other veterinarian place. Now we bring our dog there and every time we go, there's people in and out. And every time people come in and out, those dogs are barking like crazy in the kennels in back. Now, when we drop off, there was a question earlier, is there barking going on at seven in the morning? Every time that I bring the dog in, gets out of the car, and this is several dogs. They just, they run to the door, they can't wait to get in. There's no, my dog, no barking, I can't say for every dog, but I don't see it. You know, if we start looking at some of the businesses, <clears throat> people could construe nuisance, annoyance, is the web barn with the weddings that they have down there? There's a lot of noise. Is it entertainment? Is it a DJ? Is it a band? Some people could say that's an annoyance. It's a nuisance. Lucky Lou's, they have inter entertainment down there. I know that was very contentious. Some people say it's entertainment. It could be a nuisance. It could be an annoyance. Um, <clears throat> The Weathersfield small engine. I happen to bring, you know, all my equipment down there. Those motors are going all day. Is that a nuisance or an annoyance? So we have all these things, and it's not to discount any of the residents down in that area. Um, but, you know, I'm here to support uh, WAG time, and, and I hope that you, you vote to at least give it a chance and let them do the appropriate um, uh, things that need to be done to uh, lessen the noise. And um, you guys are in a tough position and, and I thank you for everything that you guys do. So I appreciate it, thank you. Thanks. All right, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Still Karen Williams, still 149 Garden Street. Uh, I skipped over this part of it, and uh, I don't want to make this sound personal. However, the key issues, and my esteemed colleague from Dale Street, if he would read the nuisance laws, the town's nuisance law, this issue is about nuisance laws. 
I don't care if they have 800 dogs there as long as they're not going on. I sat with ACO Deb Monday for two and a half, three hours. Actually, Donna and I did. And she sat there for the first hour and a half where I didn't hear a word. In the next hour and a half, five instances of what she could say to us as we sat with her is, that's in violation, <laughs> well, that would be in violation. It is not constant. And unless you live there and experience all day, seven days of the week, you'll find time periods where it's quiet, even though we're complaining about when it does happen, and that's our point. Personally, I think it's disingenuous to think that uh, Sparky and Boo Boo and Harley are happy as hell while we're living in hell. I think it's small-minded and selfish. No disrespect, I apologize to you. However, Dale Road, I don't know where she lives, they're not there. It's not four and five, six houses away. So to say my dog is happy, I'm thrilled. Your dog may be one of the ones that makes our lives unhappy. So it's the nuisance laws, not how good or bad their business is or people are or how happy their dogs are, but the dogs as a whole in that outdoor pen violate the nuisance laws of the town of Wethersfield as written by the town of Wethersfield. And if you live there every day, every week, every month, for nine freaking months of listening to this continually, you would better appreciate it. So I say, if we could take that kennel and put it four houses away from this young lady or my esteemed colleague from Dale Street, let's see uh, for nine months, see how they, see if their feelings change a little bit. It's not about the dogs, it should be about the people. Thank you. Hi, Dave McCormick again, 143 Garden Street. I just want to say the woman that spoke from Dale Road, I agree with her 100% that when people buy property near a business zone, there's risk. And the reason we have a zoning board and zoning enforcement is to mitigate that risk to the residents for what businesses go in there. So it's up to you guys to make sure that we're protected for whatever businesses get approved there. We're, we're supposed to be neighbors. We're not supposed to be impacted by just any you know, wild business that goes in there just because it's a business. Do you think any one of us want to be here at these meetings? We want to send emails continually to our town manager, phone calls, we don't get responses. Call the police, how many times on Sunday we have to call the police? We don't like living like that. It's like living with conflict. Um, so, you know, our nuisance ordinance, it's not the web barn being noisy, it is very specific, it's not subjective. It includes barking, whining dogs, not in a farm situation. So uh, please, you know, take this application in consideration, but I really would be very happy if you would deny it. It does not belong in our neighborhood, it is out of control, thank you. Thank you. Would the uh, applicant join us? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Carol Hurley, 76 Black Birch. Um, there's a million things I could say, but I don't want to ramble on. Um, what I'd like to say, though, is I keep hearing nine months in the noise, but they've actually been open 18 months, so I'm not really sure why the other nine months weren't a problem. No, it's no. Okay. Nope. But um, if regardless, I, I just want to say... Um, we're supposed to be focusing on remedying the situation, and all I hear is just just the continuing dialogue of this is how it is, it's so horrible, blah, 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 blah. And I, I don't think anyone has tried to um, deny that fact, but they're doing everything they can to try to remedy the situation, and all I hear is, well, is that definitely gonna work? Well, you know, 
he's highly confident. There's, he's a specialist, you know, he's an expert in the field. That's all we can do at this point. I mean, the only things certain in life are death and taxes. So, I mean, as far as the rest of it, it's just, you know, he's very confident and give it a try. They're willing to come back to the drawing board in three months or, you know, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. But I really feel like we're just beating a dead horse and saying the same things over and over about the noise and it's so horrible and... And, and then, oh, then the whole runoff thing started up, and then it's, well, should we have 10 dogs out there, or maybe they shouldn't be out there at this time? This all began with the noise, and we need to focus on that. And they are trying to remedy that situation, and we need to give that a chance. We can, we can talk about this for years, whether it will or will not work, and we will never know if it will work until we try it. So I think we should vote on it, because I don't want to do this every couple of weeks till last time it was almost 10.30. I, I'm busy, <laughs> you know, I have other things going on in my life. So I would really appreciate it if you made a decision tonight. And I think based on the information and the experts that he, the expert that he hired, I think it sounds like it will work. But are there any guarantees? No, but he sounds pretty darn confident. Thank you. Thank you. So would the applicant join us again at the mic? All right. I don't recall hearing any specific questions uh, that um, need to be answered. Uh, but eventually we're going to get into the hours of operation and, and what the possibilities were for constraining the activity out in the yard as well, I, I assume, um, the willingness to do so. I know that's still a question in my mind. Um, and it was clearly something that did come up in the conversation um, in terms of fewer dogs makes a decibel level, level difference, right? So is there anything that you on behalf of the applicant can um, give us in terms of constraints on the operations that he discussed that with the with the owner <coughs> should we just have him come up and no uh, if I may um, we did look at this briefly at the last session and it was questioned whether or not it would make sense to place operational constraints on the business um, and my response at that time was, if the sound attenuation alleviates the problem, why would we further constrain the business and inflict conditions on it for operations that don't make a difference ultimately in what the neighbors are experiencing? So while I don't discount the possibility of operational constraints, I would suggest that the appropriate way of doing that would be to hold open the special permit as a condition of approval that says, um, and I did have some language, uh, that that would be something that we could look at if it turns out to be necessary. But if our sound expert is right, and this is gonna get rid of the problem, why would then we arbitrarily impose a condition that affects, you know, many Wethersfield residents who bring their dogs there? What do you mean my dog can only go out for two hours? Why? Well, because is it causing a problem for the neighbors? Well, no, but it's something that got imposed just so that we could get our continued use of that outdoor area in any configuration approved. I don't think that's helpful. I don't <coughs> think it's necessary to protect the neighbors and I don't think it's helpful for my client. So are we open to operational constraints? Yes, but I would suggest this. We will commit to coming back and doing the sound analysis within three months of installation of that fence. Could be earlier. It could be right away. My sound consultant says we can do it, you know, whenever. It, he said, in fact, if you do it during the winter, it's probably a, uh, um, a more um, difficult time to attenuate the noise than it would be during the summer when 
which may seem counterproductive, but when the leaves are out, it affects, uh, it reduces the noise. In fact, that raises another issue, and you heard a little bit of discussion tonight about 18 months this business has been operation. Why did the calls only begin coming in um, in the last nine months? And there is uh, the supposition on our part that when all of the clearing took place along the railroad tracks, which happened about nine months after the dog operations began on the property, that's when some of the calls started coming in and then it built off of that. It very well may be, I just asked our sound consultant, would that have made a difference? And he said, oh yes, that could definitely make a difference. So, but that's an interesting point because if attenuation is available, whether it's through greenery that's growing or this sound wall that we've now done an analytical study and you know, based on sound acoustics should work, then we should be able to help with this issue. Maybe get rid of it entirely. I'm hoping that's the result that we're going to have. But if not, we would um, come back to you. And towns do this. West Hartford does it regularly with all their special permits. We would come back to you to determine whether additional operational or physical changes need to be made to further attenuate the outdoor noise. And we would come back to you um, as soon as after we do the sound tests and know where we are, but no later than, the sound tests we've done no later than, than three months, that's fine, after, uh, after the fence is in. And we will try and get the fence in right away. Um, and that goes to the issue of whether or not you should postpone deciding this or consider it further. I don't think there's any need to do that. We either have made a convincing case that we're going to be able to, based on expert testimony, solve this noise issue for the neighbors, or we haven't. I don't have, no one else here is a noise expert. Uh, Mr. Williams, when he was asked as to whether or not this is going to work, said he didn't think so, but he's not a noise expert, a sound consultant. We have one here. I don't think anybody can doubt the uh, the uh, professional credentials that he and his firm have brought to this particular issue. Um, and he's very convincing, he's very, and he's very comfortable in what he has told you. Uh, so we believe we can fix it. And we're betting we can fix it. And if we can't fix it, we're coming back to you and you can pose additional conditions on it. We can make that wall higher, we can make it heavier, we can roof the outdoors, if he determines that you know smaller dog groupings have an effect on the noise, then we'll do smaller gr dog groupings. He's saying that's not the case now. But we will come back to you and we will work with the neighbors to make sure their life is not you know, as awful as they have said it has been. And I don't doubt they've been, we did the testing and we knew that there were violations when those dogs were aggravated. It violated the uh, the noise level. So, I mean, they're, you know, are they sometimes hearing different dogs than our dogs? Yes, probably. But are there times when they're hearing our dogs? We're not arguing that they're not. And we're going to do something to fix that. So, um, someone else got up tonight and said there's no recourse. Once this application is done, it's done. That's not the case. And you have our word, and we suggest you impose that condition on us. And we'll come back and do whatever needs to be done to make additional changes if this doesn't work. But we think it'll work. And I think all the evidence supports the fact that it will work. So I think we, I'm going to just leave my findings with you because it's getting late. But the bottom line is you have expert testimony that shows there's a way of solving this issue for the neighbors. We're committed to doing it. It's not inexpensive. We'll do it as soon as we can get out there. As soon as this is, <coughs> if this is approved, we will, we will start immediately and take care of this issue for you. And we'll come back and look at other ways of operationally and otherwise dealing with this should it turn out that we haven't solved the problem, but we think we have. Other questions for the applicant? I'm impressed with your confidence on what you've delivered tonight. I'm also impressed on the website. Our colleague Ryan usually picks up the phone and looks at the websites before I do. Oh, I did the last meeting. You did last meeting? <laughs> you have a, a, on the site 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., but you testified that most dogs don't go out until after 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my client tells me it's, he was previously said 745, 750. 745. Yes. It also says closed, 
for plate care on Sundays. Uh, is that still the policy, and will that still yes, be? Yes, that's the case. And so the, the, so the dogs they're, they're hearing on Sunday are not coming from our facility. Uh, no, there's boarding. There's boards. Just boarding. Yeah. Yes, they have up to, you said it. Oh, okay. Okay, so what you're saying is really it's part, not of what's daycare part of the policy it's, again. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Joe? Question: you know, if, if the commission were to decide to approve the application, are you agreeable to having your noise expert um, certify that the construction was in accordance with his plan and submit that in writing to the commission so that it, at least uh, there would be confirmation that it had been built properly? Yes. I guess on the flip side, just to probe a little bit more, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that what you're saying is if there are still issues and if this commission were to conclude that the only way to solve those issues were to require you to fully enclose or not conduct unenclosed outdoor activity that you... Uh, you would at least recognize our ability to do that by imposing the condition if it proved necessary. Counselor, you're I pushing me very good. It would depend <laughs> what, on facts, obviously, yes, it would. but you're it not, would, I'm not, you're not taking the, the position that. that once approved, we would lose our ability to, to say impose it's got to be operational enclosed. or construction changes that solve the problem. Yes, and I discuss that with my client. Okay. So uh, we're at a point where we're deciding whether we want to close the hearing. I, for one, um, haven't heard additional questions that we've asked that the applicant hasn't been able to pose, consistent with what uh, the council has suggested. I tend to think we've gotten what we asked for. So uh, are we ready to move on? And if so, I'll entertain a motion. Move to close the hearing. Second. Are you guys comfortable with that? Are we discussing? Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. You're not involved, right? <laughs> right. So, discussion. So I think the the discussion, if you're on one side, the the word that you use is nuisance. If you're on the other side, the word that you use is sound or noise. And the difference is compliance. So if you have a method of reducing nuisance to within compliant levels, you eliminate the issue. So like, that's kind of the only thing. I, I realize that there's still going to be a sound that's heard and that there are some sounds that are more annoying than others. <laughs> but at, at least in terms of our discussion, we're just trying to make sure that, because it is a subjective term, what is a nuisance, what is a sound, and we're just trying to make sure that we're following what our code is saying. And I think, you know, as soon as, like, a sound is a nuisance until it's within compliance. And, right? Like, so I, according, I, according to what we are debating. Well, I, I guess I don't really know that I would read it the same way, right? A nuisance is subjective, and it's got no, it's yeah. got no decibel thresholds attached to nuisance. Mm -hmm. So it could be well under, the nuis well under the threshold and still be considered a nuisance to somebody, because it's okay. a subjective term, yeah. right? So that's why my like question. Like I'm trying to like define that somehow within this. Yeah. Because well, it is so that's my question to the applicant. You know, what if? Because it's entirely possible 20 decibels, and that's huge, right? When we talked about it last time, 10 decibels is a huge difference. 20 is tremendous, right? And there's going to be a lot of money spent, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily going to solve this, right? And um, 
Um, it, it could very well, when it's all built, be perceived as a nuisance still by Certainly. the closest of residents and the furthest, the furthest of residents. And it's a, it's a big financial commitment to go down this road and, you know, three months from now, test or not. Okay, the test says you're compliant. Well, good. You know, um, I still got right. so 30 residents I mean, that are. Compliance, but it's still a nuisance. So it's right. a, it's a, it's a and where do we go from there? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't like this commission being in the position of having to make a decision as to what constitutes a nuisance because the term is so vague. <coughs> however, I'm going to say a big however, that is a burden that is placed upon us because we're the ones who have to deny the permit or grant the permit with, with conditions. Okay. Right. And I, I, I think Joe's idea in, in the, the testimony that came forth from of the town, uh, from the council of the applicant based upon Mr. Hammer's comments uh, seem to be uh, tighten up that that discretion and, and give us an opportunity to do which I don't like to do but I think we're forced to do to make that decision if we're going to uh, uh, give any approval uh, to this uh, to this permit <coughs> it, it's troubling um, because of its discretion uh, but I think we, we need to, uh, you know, make a decision and um, there's a good step forward with, with your comments, Joe. So, so I must admit that what well, your comments with the comments of council based upon your questions. Uh, you know, I was concerned when I came here tonight, I didn't notice the appendix on the sound report. I didn't go to the last page. I thought I was looking at the same document and I thought there were no uh, additional modifications till I got here and saw the plan, right? So I am, I am uh, happy that the applicant proposed the third wall. I'm, I'm glad that they proposed to, com to complete one of the other walls and basically the whole area is now enclosed with a wall. And while the, the infiltration trench is a secondary issue in my mind to this issue tonight, that's obviously an improvement, but it's all about the sound and I think we all sat here and wondered why the third side wasn't enclosed and perhaps why, you know, why are you letting the dogs get excited with somebody who comes walking around the back, close it off, nobody sees it, the dogs will have that much less to be excited about if it was enclosed, right? So that part of the, of the proposal, the new parts, uh, make me feel more comfortable about it. But I do anticipate that the owner is going to go down this path where there is no real solution to a nuisance complaint, um, and, and I don't know that, um, I, d I don't know how we solve that, except maybe getting into some of the things Joe was describing, whether the applicant wants it or not, we can impose restrictions um, by ourselves, um, even if they weren't willing to offer any. Um, I, I guess I, I also understand that the process that took place as, as ugly as we can all assume it was, right? why was it approved, you know, should it have come to us in the first place? If it had come to m this body in the first place, I personally, having seen this plan, knowing intuitively that there would only have been a couple of residents that were interested enough to join us for the, for the public hearing, we would be elated by this proposal. I would be elated by this proposal. I would say, that's great. We probably wouldn't get this much sound attenuation. We might have asked for it. We might have gotten something. But my perception is this probably would have been approved with very little public um, angst with something this or less, right? So there's a little part of me that says this is not a bad start. We can talk, you know, I, I think I've been, you know, with the changes that have been posed tonight, I think I could find myself going this way as long as I know the record shows, the owner knows there's, you know, there may not be a good yeah, solution, and you good. know, <laughs> so um, that's kind of where I'm headed here. I yeah. had that same thought of like, if this came before us, like, I mean, what, what, where would we have gone with it? I mean, if the wall was this robust and if there was this kind of expert sort of testimony to it, I don't, know, I still don't know, like, because I don't know what the neighbor response would have been on that as a as a proactive scenario as opposed to now what we're doing right yeah i mean and, and in that case it would have been entirely hypothetical to imagine yeah. what 40 dogs would sound like when no one yeah. 
probably has endured that. I guess the other thing that, that just kind of is important to me is knowing that, you know, like, like the Middletown Avenue situation, denying it doesn't improve it because the, the outcome that the neighbors would want in that situation still is within the complete discretion of the zoning enforcement officer who has shown no inclination to issue a cease and desist at this point. And I don't know whether, you know, if, if we act negatively, whether he would feel any differently about that and whether that would be appealed and so forth. So I don't know, you know, I, I don't think necessarily denying this guarantees the desirable outcome. I just, I guess I would just add that um, you know, I think that I think it's harder for everybody here because we all appreciate what the neighbors have been through, and none of us would have wanted to go through it. So I think, given you know, given the time that transpired and the issues that they had, I understand their feelings. But I think, you know, with all that said, I think it really comes down to: do we think that a convincing case has been made you know essentially by the expert for the applicant number one if as if we were viewing this from the beginning had it come to us um, and I think you know having the ex the uh, applicant acknowledge that if this doesn't work as expected that uh, that um, you know they would they realize there could be operational constraints, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, you know, to deal with it. And you know, I think one of the things that's sort of difficult in any of these, well, in lots of special permit applications and when they involve noise is, you know, we just have to make a decision based on what the experts are telling us will work. There's not a thousand percent guarantee for any of this stuff. So the other, you know, the other option is just to say no, but I think we've got to, just decide do we have a reasonable comfort level at this point based on what's been presented and or what further could be done if it <coughs> were necessary and decide it that way. Um, but again, I, I think given the history and how long it's gone on, and I appreciate this and understand it, and I'd probably feel the same way if I were a neighbor, I would be skeptical of a lot of what I'm hearing, you know, be, because of that. So it, it makes it a harder call, but I am, you know, I, 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 again, if we looked at it fresh, Tom, like you say, I think now we maybe have the benefit of more information, maybe a more robust package of controls that somebody would have offered up ahead of time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, I, I think a case has been made and uh, I think there's a reasonable basis to, to give, it a, give it a try um, based on the case that's been made. My initial reaction was that I'd be opposed to this application, but given the testimony this evening and the assurances that we received from the applicant. We received more assurances and almost guarantees from the applicant than we have from any other application that I can recall. Um, and I think that takes some of the burden off uh, if as long as the applicant <coughs> is willing to allow that to happen, uh, I, I certainly at this point uh, would like to see him have an opportunity uh, to uh, to put it into effect. I have some doubts, but here again, uh, I'm impressed with the, with the level uh, of expertise that came before us tonight to the extent that I'm willing to, to give it a shot as long as I can afford it. So, so my thoughts um, probably similar to what, what all of you have said already. You know, you're, there's, there's a business that's already thriving and there's a neighborhood that has thrived for years and years and years and you're creating this, you're trying to create a balance between this issue. 
And, um, and so I, I think that what gives me comfort is that, you know, you do have a noise expert and there is a wall that, that is being proposed and the amount of <coughs> volume that'll be decreased is, is substantial, substantially more than, than is the, um, than our ordinances allow. So I, I just think that I, I feel confident that, that the neighbors would hear a lot less noise. I think dog barking is different than, than um, hearing music at, at the web, you know, at the, at the web uh, facility or, or hearing music at Lucky Loop. Dog barking and whining and fighting or whatever is a nuisance. And I think that that wall has a really good <coughs> shot of addressing that nuisance. Now, the other part is that there's always, if it doesn't work, there's always plan B. So I'm comforted with the fact that, th that the applicant is willing to come back and say, okay, we tried this. You know, the neighbors could come back and say, yep, we tried this and, and no go, or yes, that's excellent, thank you. But we have a very small window of opportunity is what I'm thinking in terms of constructability because winter is coming, installation, you know, you have that small window to install that wall. You know, to, to install the wall won't take that much time. It's not like we're creating this concrete structure and it's going to take three months to, to install. So um, I, I, um, I do hear you. I hear the neighbors, and I think many of us, if not all the members on the commission, hear you. But you're trying to do something to create a balance, and I think this is a, a good solution. Um, with the caveat that the applicant can come back <coughs> if the if the wall doesn't doesn't work to the satisfaction of our commissioners, <laughs> that's what I have to say. Thank you. Are so you it's not you're done. You're done. Okay. Um, so, so as is n you know normally the case um, to move the process along, you always make a positive motion and see if it passes, right? So would somebody like to craft? Like I'll, I'll give it a shot. Right, for, for purposes of, of continuing the discussion, um, I would move that the application be approved subject to the following conditions. Um, number one, that the noise expert who has presented the report on behalf of the applicant uh, certify in writing that the construction of the wall has been done um, in accordance with the plans and specifications and that that be submitted in writing to staff uh, upon the completion of construction. Uh, second, I would uh, state that within three months of completion of the wall, uh, additional noise testing shall be done uh, and the results and some type of report uh, submitted to the commission for our review. And third, that the applicant uh, will return to the commission uh, at the commission's option following the testing and the submission of the report and in the event that there are either exceedances of the town noise ordinance or in the event that there have been uh, continuing complaints from the neighbors regarding the, the noise even following that installation um, that the commission may consider uh, and impose further requirements in terms of additional physical noise abatement measures and or operational constraints. So would you consider adding um, uh, after you said three months, but no later than April 1st, 
just so that if there was some delay in getting the fence installed, yes. to get this issue resolved before the good weather comes. Agreed, and yes. Okay. Well, I was actually going to have a question on that, actually saying within mm -hmm. a month of completion or something like that, where, because there's no need to mm -hmm. wait in my mind. Like, if you're going to do it, like, let's say they build it next week, mm -hmm. and three months from now isn't really much of a difference than now. It's going to be colder and probably more snow. Does, does uh, I appreciate that. Too. Does 60 days perhaps make sense? You, do you, uh, again, yeah, I'm just wondering if, yeah. if it's too quick, then I don't want it too quick. You know, are we maybe not getting the full array of information? We haven't had right. sufficient time to see if there's other issues that are being presented. You know, is, is 60 maybe a compromise? And I guess the other thing that I didn't I didn't indicate is do we want to say that the testing should involve you know two separate days rather than a single sampling event yeah i was going to suggest that it be two separate days and that they be days that are of customary operation levels you know so they don't pick a day where it's pouring and the dogs are inside or anything like that or you know it could be raining yeah i mean just Something kind of too. two representative mm -hmm. days of of operation just so that you know not accusing anybody of anything but you, you don't want to have anyone say that they gamed it by picking you know one day over another sure so the only objection I have is the reference to the town noise ordinance because just because in, in my view just because something does not it may comply with a noise ordinance, something that is on a continuous basis still may cause a nuisance. I don't want to be any confusion that they were going by any standard. At, at this point, there is no, we haven't developed a standard for what constitutes a noise level, which would constitute a nuisance. And I would hate to say that uh, the use uh, could be interpreted, your motion could be interpreted as the use of the, the town sound ordinance. I, I, I understand that, and I thought I had stated in the alternative that if there were either exceedances of the noise ordinance or continued neighbor complaints, which I intended to be the more general catch-all to cover that. Yeah, yeah that, okay. that was what I thought. Yep. Any, any, you're gonna come up with business hours, limited dog numbers out in the... I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm thinking, George, if we're giving them, if they're gonna have 60 days <laughs> to test on two days, come back and see how it works. I guess I'm I'm not sure that so we no know what we're, I'm not sure whether it would just sort of be well, that's phase random three. to impose those restrictions yeah. now, hoping phase three. that it's yeah. that's gonna be satisfactory at the end of the 60 days. Yeah. It, it might be important for when the testing is done the next time around, an actual count of the dogs is put into the report. So we have a level. You know, is it 10 dogs versus 40 or 50 dogs? So I think that, because that was testified that it has an impact on the ultimate um, decibel level. So that might be something could be factored into that uh, further analysis. Should we also touch on uh, maintenance also? Um, that the owner would be, would, would also be responsible for maintaining the wall if, if there's any sort of damage to it? Sure, so that it right, so that it remains consistent Intact with its original yeah, yeah, exactly. specifications yep. and so forth. Yes. Is the dumpster in the right place, Peter? Uh, no, no. no. <laughs> I know it is now, but I mean, they're showing the plans. It doesn't look like it. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Where do you want it? Do we need it to be addressed? Well, th that it blocks off, you know, four or five parking spaces. I don't know that there's a parking issue there, so adding the parking into the mix, uh, probably parking cars that close to where the dogs are going to be might. So, yeah. so, so it's apples. Sure. I'm not sure it's. Uh, it's but you know, the the good thing is the the fence is the the dumpster is behind the building, so you don't really see it. But there probably could be a better place, and that space could be utilized for something. Um, that we normally wouldn't uh, have a dumpster sitting in the middle of a parking lot. And I guess, just so it's clear, do we need to reference the fact that this is all being done in accordance with their SH acoustics report, you know, as amended with the addendum and in accordance with the plan. most recent plan that was submitted yeah. to us? Yeah. 
So, so for the purposes of the residents, um, I just want to reiterate what I think is going to happen, right? So 60 days at a minimum, at least 60 days from now, we'll have a report, a report that <coughs> encompasses at least two testing days along with the counts of the animals on those days, days that are typical operations, right? Uh, and the part that I'm not clear about, we will review that in a meeting setting, correct? So it's a public discussion. Mm -hmm. um, are we suggesting that um, there's an official process by which the applicant is here or is it an invitation to join us as we do it and ask questions and it's you know it's a public comment so so the n neighbors will be notified how do, you know that's probably something you need to need to discuss i had made a note about neighbor notification i was going to you know take that responsibility on myself but um you could certainly pass that burden on to the applicant it's up it's up to you as to how you want to handle that and uh, i would imagine it would um, you would want it to be in a formal hearing setting so everybody has an opportunity to ask the relevant questions. So uh, it probably needs to be advertised in some public way uh, as we would normally do. So we may want to stick to the standard public hearing Good notice idea requirements. And the applicant can send out the notification. Okay. Let me just talk to the town. Okay. Well, I don't think most of those people would get the notices, would they? Uh, yes, the um, if you uh, you'll have the aerial up there, but a lot of those properties on the on just across the tracks get okay. covered. Not all of them farther out, but um, right. okay. and I, you know I and I have communicated with the neighbors, so we'll continue to do that. Right. All right, and then there's the maintenance of the wall. Are those a basic premise thing? Okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any discussion on the motion? The additional details thereof? And if not, I'll take a vote. All those in favor say aye and maybe raise your hand. Aye. Four, five, aye. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Eight. Eight and one. And you got the one. Good. One. What do you, do you vote? Four. Oh, four, right? Yes, okay. Aye. Okay. Aye. I just say aye. Okay. So it's it's eight to one. The the proposal passes. Let's get that wall up. Let's get the testing done. Let's make sure we solve it. Do the minutes while Peter is off I'll raising make a effort. motion to approve. Second. Any edits? They're in great shape. Perfect. Thank you for that commentary. Any edits? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Staff we, we heard we heard plan B's. What did we hear? So so <coughs> me, so so if you'd like to hang around for the public comment part, we can probably continue it. I didn't hear what you were talking about. All right, uh, staff reports. So a couple of just things just to uh, keep you in the loop on. Uh, we have our third parking study com committee, Old Weathersfield Parking Study Committee meeting tomorrow uh, evening at seven o'clock in this room. Next Wednesday night, for those of you who want to attend, is the 30th annual Salute to Business at the Country Club. If you do want to attend, uh, let, yeah. de let Denise know. I, I thought Denise would be here. I, okay. I'm going. All right, so if you could just 
check in, call her, and okay. work out those arrangements, or, right. si yeah, or sign up on the on the website. Yeah. That would be great. Um, thirdly, uh, there is, and I don't know if I mentioned this at the last meeting, there was a uh, meeting, a settlement meeting um, with the town attorney and the attorneys for Mr. Tartaglia regarding the outstanding <coughs> uh, fines and legal fees associated with the violation at 61 Arrow Road. So that is nearing, uh, hopefully nearing some sort of uh, resolution. Um, I haven't seen the final uh, details of the proposed settlement and what the number is, but nevertheless, Good luck. that has winded its way <laughs> through the legal. Are you sure he's going to be happy? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure anyone will be happy with, the, with, <laughs> these, be with these settlements. But, and then lastly, uh, and I think I did mention this to you, uh, the zoning officer did issue uh, a cease and desist order to Lucky Lou's Outdoor Music. Uh, that has been appealed. And wait till the third now. <laughs> that, that has been appealed to the. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is what the composed of? He was issued a cease and desist, so he no longer can uh, have no outside music. No well, no, he was because of the violations. No yeah, he's he's out of business uh, at at this point going forward. So really, yes, for the music, for the music, for the music, outdoor music, outdoor music. Outdoor music. Outdoor outdoor music. So um, it, that has been appealed to the ZBA. It'll be heard at their uh, January meeting. So just uh, so you know that that is uh, winding its way. Just to talk to um, Houston. I suppose he could come back to you guys, reapply, um, uh, depending on how that goes. So well, how stay, stay tuned. It may um, be coming uh, back to you. But, uh, pardon my ignorance. Yes. What are the remedies that the ZBA could give him? They could um, overrule the zoning officer and give him Back when his activity. Had, when he still active. Or he had on nothing more they, than they might give. They might be able to. I, it, it, that, that's kind of an unknown. Sometimes the way these things go. But really, the focus is whether there was an error uh, in the order issued by the zoning officer to issue a cease and desist based on the way he phrased it. No, whether he no, was whether out he uh, misinterpreted. misinterpreted the ordinance. Right, or there was no violation that warranted issuing There's a cease no and desist order. No right. violation. Arbitrary and right. So that's going to be the Zoning Board of Appeals deals with that first, and then depending on how that goes, uh, it may or may not um, be coming back because obviously he could reapply so like anyone that else could. Saying to argue it, basically. Right. In so. front of the judge and that sort of thing. Okay. So well, those. The ZBA. 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 And then obviously you do have a couple of applications uh, for your next meeting. Uh, so um, the, uh, the next meeting will be held, which will be the 17th of December. So honestly, I didn't look ahead. So is the um, yeah these two at the bottom. Pedro's coming back. Yep, finally. For, up on the Berlin Turnpike. Well, it, well, th I, they're still waiting for the DOT comments in writing. That's what I was. I uh, but the DOT did require significant changes to their curb cut. And uh, so they are waiting for that. They hope it'll be uh, available to them by that what, date. What's that about the curb cut? Sorry. The DOT um, has weighed in at least verbally. Berlin Turnpike. The Berlin Turnpike about the curb cuts. Yeah, what they say. Uh, one curb cut. Yeah, consolidated. Two now is a little. Right. Yeah. It was kind of a gas station Which, kind of pull-in yeah. thing. So that. So um, they don't mind they're cutting across that lane. They have that. They have legal access to the highway, so they had to give them something. They had to give them something, right? Right. But two. As, as I understand, that, yeah. I'm sure it's a farther down mm -hmm. stream as they do yeah. a lot of things. They'll push it right down to the other property in the lot. Maybe. Probably. Okay. And yeah. then you've got the uh, application on uh, Maple Street for the restaurant, so that should be a uh, should be a lively meeting. <laughs> When's that coming? The next meeting on the oh, 17th really? of December. Uh, has it gone before the gone through design review and all that? Yeah, it's gone, it's gone through historic district instead of design review because it's in the historic oh, district right, okay. Okay. and through the Wetlands Commission. Any, any real problems with it from uh, that point of view? Uh, they, they both approved them. Oh. It, it wasn't easy, but they both approved them, so. Okay. Okay. Yep, good. So Thank you. Um, let's circle back to public comments. Mr. Williams. Karen Williams, 149 Garden Street. As a defeated sore loser, I would like to thank you for your patience, your forbearance, and I think your understanding. The only question I, uh, not a question, just a comment. Um, 
Corrective so, next steps, corrective, how, what are the next steps is what you asked. Right? Well, and you know, in essence, really very quickly without making your long night longer, um, what is plan B? I never, first of all, I am not, as I started to say to you, I, she's right, the counselor's right, I am not a noise expert. But their noise expert said several times tonight in the previous meeting that he couldn't guarantee what his study and analysis was would be guaranteed to work. Ergo, so, what's plan B on their part? Right. And so that's what we asked, what's next? Yeah, but we what, asked what on, was on her response? I didn't get it. So there were a whole bunch of answers. There was a thicket, there was a thickening of the wall, there was a raising of the wall, there was a covering over the over the thing, all and and operational changes. All okay. of those were on the I don't the have table. my hearing aids in, so thank you for that update. <clears throat> okay. And the last point is one of the people up here talked about, you know, when you move in, you know, you gotta take what happens. I've been in town for seventy years. Mm -hmm. I've lived where we live now for 40 years, just about 40 years. Uh, we were there first. They moved in, we didn't. They changed the rules, we didn't. Mm. Yeah, so, is Understood. plan- Understood. I'm Understood. Going with you, sir. I know, and I thank you very much. You were the Lone Ranger. I noticed how many years those kids have lived there. Yeah. So, but thank you, we had our shot. I hope you guys will stay real tight on that because we will. And, and Thank we, you. And we understand that. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 As usual, I would assume there are no nays. Yeah. yeah, I've been to New Canaan for a playoff game before. I don't need to go again. Exciting.